Good morning, everyone. So, you are the fourth batch of the regular classes of Vision IAS for this year. I am Pratibha. I will be your program coordinator as long as you are here in Vision IAS as a part of your classroom. Okay, so before I start, I just want to know how many of you enrolled for 2018, 19, sorry, first 2018. Okay, most of you. And then 2019. Okay, one, two, good. Okay, 2020, good, okay. So I'll tell you the difference also, guys. What is this difference? So I am just going to give you a very, very brief introductory session about your classroom and your student portal and about other small things. And after me, Jayesh sir will come for taking history classes. So you all must have received your login and password. Yes, sir. Did you all? Yes. Good. So did you open your login password and see? Yes. See, okay. So this is how it will be your uh, student portal. So under the classes, let's say you are all offline student, you come, sit here, attend your classes. Online students will watch the same classes when they are not here. And you guys, when sometimes you are not being able to come to class and you want to watch the classes online, always at the same time you can sit in your wherever you are and then you can watch the live classes, ask your doubts through live chat option, but uh, don't stop coming to classes. There's nothing like sitting in front of the faculty and listening to the classes and you have paid extra compared to online students. So I'll just show you... Uh, <coughs> A rough idea like I'm just randomly start showing you some classes which is going on live or which will start live now so this is how your live classes will be there this is your live place and you will find your live classes here so and apart from that once after today's class is over after by end of the day it will be post processed and it will be uploaded under the respective subject section Today, for example, history class one. So after, until post processing is done, you can see under the live section. Once after the post processing is done, the video will be moved to under the specific subject. Let's say history of modern India under class one. You will find like this. Whatever it has been taught, you will find. So then. After this class, the, you all have a batch coordinator assigned to you. She is like a class teacher or he is like a class teacher to you. Whatever needs you have, whatever grievances you have, you can always contact her or him who is there. They will be sitting here for you. Batch coordinator is Shibra ma'am. She will take care of all your needs. She can cl clarify your academic doubts when you are not being able to talk to faculty. and. Uh, she will be sitting with you like a student during the classes like you guys take notes she will be making the synopsis of the class so after let's say two or three months you want to know where exactly a specific topic has been taught so this synopsis should help you it is like an index page of that day's class any class for that matter then you have few self-test questions so in here, self-test question, there might be a one marker, there might be MCQ, there might be two marker subjective questions of any sort, just to test your knowledge, like what is being taught, based on what is being taught in that day's class. And this is not for evaluation, it will not be evaluated, it is just for you guys to put an effort to know and learn, and if you don't find answers, check in with your books or internet, however you want, or discuss with the batch coordinator. The most important part is assignment. Okay, so in assignment questions, we give you every day one subjective question. Okay, so one subjective question is to write an answer for 200 or 250 words cake answer. And you can download, if you are not here, you can download the blank assignment sheet. Take a printout, take some 200 copies of Xerox photocopy and keep it. Every day keep writing an answer. Use maximum of one paper to write an answer. 
practice yourself i think most of you are freshers from college there in college you will have to write answer for three pages four pages fill the papers in upsc you have to keep it short and sweet crisp 250 words max is 250 words even 250 words is more and in that 250 words how you are being able to put in your ideas what you have understood from the question is very important from day one you will start practicing this so for example today you are getting an assignment maximum you can submit your assignment in hard copy that is writing in a paper and submitting to the batch coordinator maximum by friday today's assignment not beyond that and if you want to submit beyond that you have to write scan and then upload it in your online portal just by click click here click on the question you want the this batch don't have assignment question so there will be an assignment question here when you click it there will be an option for you guys to upload it and upload it the most important thing is in your blank assignment sheet there are few things that you have to fill at least your registration number and your assignment code is minimum assignment code assignment code can you find here this is your assignment code and your registration number is must if these two are not found then it will be very difficult for us to evaluate it gets delayed so many other things and when i say give some time it will take some 48 hours to 60 hours to evaluate your assignment because a batch coordinator sits with you for five hours in the class and then they have to go answer the queries like you so many people will keep asking queries they'll answer that and then they'll evaluate your assignments it is not possible for them to continuously work for 12 14 hours right so let's give them time but they'll you will get it if you're finding any difficulty and if you think certain things are not answered still after waiting you have not received you can always write to classroom at the rate vision is dot in you can note down two email ids i think you all must have few of you who have registered long back would have uh, received the schedule, class schedule. Yes. yes. So every week on Saturdays, you will receive your class schedule. And make sure your registered email ID and phone number is right with us. And at end of the class today, you will receive an FAQ through mail. Keep that FAQ, read that FAQ very carefully. It will help you how to upload an assignment, how to download an assignment, where I should see what, how to upload a mini test, what is a mini test, so many things. So I spoke to you about assignments, one thing. The next one is mini tests. Okay, so the mini tests are nothing but you have both for prelims and mains. So this mini test will go in accordance with the class like just like assignment that goes in according to your daily classes mini tests are something which will be held after 10 days initially after 10 days of your classes because at least you being fresh you have just started your class today you will need at least 10 days to grasp a subject or to complete certain portions in a subject once after that you will start getting your timetable for mini tests which will be based on what has been covered in the class for the past one week or past 10 days depending on how we have divided the syllabus we have a standard split of portions for a subject let's say for modern indian history we have two subjective tests and mcq test we have five to seven mcq tests so we will wait we every day take note of the synopsis and what the topic has been covered in class based on the coverage we'll give you and for prelims test almost it will be once the prelims mini test starts in a week at least you will have three tests you can go to the test center after your class and appear for that test and the second thing is mains mini test it will be one or one maybe a week or two maybe a week if one saturday and the other on saturday uh, sunday it will there will be a break for you guys to prepare so this is mini test and this will also go in accordance to your class and the third one is all india test series all india test series of prelims and mains will not be there according to your classes for example you are starting with history and geography but all india test series have started with polity 
ओके सो बाय द टाइम यू गाइस फिनिश योर पॉलिट सॉरी हिस्ट्री मैक्सिमम वी वुड हैव कंप्लीटेड आर टू पॉलिटी टेस्ट्स देयर सो इट विल नॉट बी पॉसिबल फॉर यू गाइस टू राइट ऑल इंडिया टेस्ट सीरीज ऑफ हिस्ट्री because it is completely independent from your classroom program we have just given you an access so that you can write it whenever the test is released and whenever you have completed your portion and keep in mind or accept assignments see assignments maximum 2 3 days and then after that if you want to submit it online it is a week time not beyond that and for mini test prelims and mains this is till the day of pre you can write it and for mains up to 10 days before your mains examination you can write it but i would suggest you you keep writing mains test series whenever it is given because you also have all india test series mains to write so there is so much assessments for you guys so you have to run along with us don't you i mean you can breathe but try to come towards like in whatever speed we are going and it is a very normal speed it is not too much for you guys and uh, you will have pt365 and mains 365 you know visions current affairs program have you all heard okay so this is a comprehensive current affairs program of one year for prelims and mains which will be held 45 days before the respective examination for offline students and online students for both you will have online access of the class you don't have offline access i think you all would have read about it in brochure and material on the first day like uh, most of you would have got set one and after that once there are certain subjects which will be distributed di during the beginning of the first day or second day of the class and if you are not present on that day and if you are not being able to get that material in the class after that day you will collect your material from karol bag there is a material distribution center you can collect it from there an id card is very necessary those who don't have your id card again please show your slip you have made payment in karol bag again and collect your id cards also so and all your details regarding your classes you will find under important links and if a faculty is distributing uh some handouts or today in history sir is showing some powerpoint presentation it will be uploaded under the class handout section and your prelims test series mains test series all this will be found under you know in the dashboard so you will find in the prelims you will find in the mains and uh, current affairs material again monthly whenever it is ready on day 1 once it is ready it will be distributed in class and after that it will be distributed you can collect it from material distribution center and for, for people who have joined for 2019 and 2020 your class and your class access will be there until the results of the prelims examination you are writing that is not the prelims results the final results let's say you are writing in 2018 you have joined for the 2018 batch you are considered as 2018 batch which means you will appear for your prelims in 2018 and the final results of 2018 will be somewhere in 2019 may after the whole process is over prelims mains and interview so your video access will be there till 2019 and those who have applied for 2019 your video access will be there till 2020 and those who have applied for 2020 your video access will be there till 2021 plus those who have joined for the 2019 you will get an additional all india test series and uh, pt365 and mains 365 of that year and for 2021 you will get it for 20 and 19 okay is there any other doubts that you have regarding your classroom program subject will start and we will go maximum of two subjects at a time anything else no queries okay so you will get an faq today by end of the day 
If you have anything, you can always write it to me. You can write to classroom at the red vision is dot in. And uh, one more thing I'll tell you, when you go to your profile, there is something called complaint. It is actually not necessarily you have to give complaint. Yes, you can. <laughs> This process is just if in case you have not received anything or you want to write, mainly you choose classroom, new complaint, select your complaint type, so it is classroom. If it is classroom, I will directly get it. And you can also write directly to my mail. So wherever you write, I will see your, whether it is your classroom at the red vision eyes dot in or to my ID directly or here we'll see it and then if you want to say something about your dispatch i have not received material please choose the right option that is and your classroom academic dogs please do not ask, ask here it would be very difficult for us to keep track because vision has thousands and thousands of students who belong to test series who belong to just pt365 batches or mains 365 batches and you guys belong to RB4, regular M4 batch students. So when you ask your doubts in your classroom section under talk to expert, did you guys see something called talk to expert? So if you ask there, your classes, whoever asks some doubts, it will be there. Uh, okay, your classroom queries. If there is any doubts which is asked, there will be a track, nobody has asked doubts there. So, so this is it. Anything else? Okay, all the best people. So, you will have your history classes now. And Shipra ma'am is there for any doubts. And I am always there. You can drop a mail. You can come and meet me. And yeah, the most important thing is feedback system of Vision IS, Which I will just tell you right, right out now. So, at the second class of every subject, Normally also during any period of your time, there is something called feedback form which is available in hard copy and there is a feedback form even in online. Don't worry about who has written that you don't want to write your registration number. This is not college. This is, there is no internal marks deduction, nothing. So feel free to write what you want to write because your feedback will help us improve. And another thing, okay, what is the point of giving feedback I have given? There is no step taken immediately. Guys, when st steps to be taken, it is not based on one individual person. But still don't stop writing. Whatever you want to convey to us, make use of the feedback form, write it. Batch coordinators will distribute. Even if they forget to distribute, you ask them. Not necessarily from them. You can ask the support, but you ask first to them. They will issue a feedback form, write it anytime, it will come to me or it will come to Lalit sir, who is another person along with me, handles classroom program, we will see it and we will not share your details to anyone. So, okay. So, write to us, whatever, if there is any need that you want, even if you think, ma'am, mujhe ye chahiye, humko ye material nahi mila. See, we, will, we might not be able to come and personally deal with your issues. But we will see, who knows, your small feedback might help us solving a bigger problem. Okay, whether it is about anything, subject or classes, speed, water is not there, washrooms are not tidy, anything, just write it. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Now, just a second. So, my name is Dr. J.H. Khadar. I will be talking to you about modern Indian history first. And uh, I've done my master's in political science and international relations from JNU, as well as a PhD in public policy also from JNU. Now, uh, <coughs> we'll be talking about modern Indian history and uh, this is, I understand, your first class. Like your first, first class. <laughs> okay. So, we'll be talking about modern Indian history roughly in around 13 lectures or so, 13 or 14 lectures, okay? And, uh, and uh, in this period, what I understand the fact that since you are starting and this is your first, very first class, it will take a bit of time to get acclimatized to, you know, the way of teaching. And in fact, the way of teaching you will see differs from one teacher to another, 
okay so for example predominantly uh, we all used to a format of teaching where uh, you know somebody explains something and then dictates and then you write and then you go back and then you read the notes this is not the way at least it is going to work in history okay rather why i'm saying so that this is not why it's going to work because of two reasons firstly history is anyways boring okay secondly if i keep dictating and you keep writing what will happen is that at the end of the time firstly you'll have a book another book that you would have written by that time the many which have been written before you'll also write one more okay and what is the problem there too with this firstly it will take way more time if i just keep dictating everything and you keep writing everything secondly that would mean that if i have to dedicate too much time to dictate i will not be in a position to go into many technical aspects or many nuances that i would have done otherwise so the so the trade off that would be would be between the depth or between dictating so dictating on the the advantage of dictating in the class is that people feel more confident that they are they're taking back this you know that this is the take away from the class these 500 these 200 pages is the take away from modern indian history the reality is 200 pages are never a take away from any subject any subject will actually give you a take away of more than not more than 50 60 pages the rest is basically filling the context okay so and the whole aspect of coming to the class your should be to reduce the information load and stick to what is the core essentiality okay because there is a lot of noise you have you know people will keep talking that this book has to be read that book has to be read you need to read you know this source also and complement it with that source also so rather than getting into all this worthwhile debate and you know uh, and me wasting your time predominantly on writing the focus should be more on understanding but how do we ensure that what we have understood we have not lost right how do we consolidate so for that at least for the first class i uh, what i'll be doing is the whole process of teaching goes like this that i'll explain you certain things okay on the top of that i'll be drawing some flow charts here not dictating just drawing some flow charts you draw those flow charts with me whatever i'm drawing here you draw it with me okay secondly but where it comes to the core theory what you supposed to read so for this every topic that i deal before the class itself you'll have a ppt uploaded on your student platform it, it would be in the form of a pdf or a ppt whatever and you, for the first class i'll take you through the ppt so as to so that you get a hang of how is it organized the ppt is not organized in a para wise fashion where you have you know chapters to read it is organized in a point wise fashion it's kept in a point wise fashion recognizing the need for your exam and also there also there are some things which are marked in blue and something which are marked in red whatever is marked in blue and red is something that you need to remember whatever is in black is predominantly to build a world view around it okay so that so we'll go through the first ppt and probably then you'll realize okay that this is how you're supposed to do it so what so basically you don't need to write anything apart from what i am writing beyond that whatever you need is there in the ppt and what is the way you go through the next class that you come for modern indian history you revise what has been done before just go through the ppt that has already been uploaded no need for reading something before and coming to at least the history class i can't speak for others but i can speak for myself so for history you don't need to read anything beforehand and then come to the class okay just read what has already been done in the last class before now that is there so let's firstly also one thing that you'll realize over a period of time every teacher is going to tell you that the prelims and the mains both are qualitatively very different exams the prelims has a very different requirement than the mains okay that is the reason why you will see there would be a number of toppers and a number of people who get selected who barely scratch through the prelims okay if the cut off is 100 they're getting 102 but they're doing exceptionally well in the mains there are also another category of people who are like 30 marks above the cut off in prelims and in the mains they relative they relatively have a tougher time so basically what i'm trying to say is that the prelims requires a different set of aptitude and the mains are different okay and we'll have to club both of them because when we are preparing one thing also is essential for you to realize you don't prepare for the prelims first 
and after that start preparing for the mains. You prepare for both the mains and the prelims together. So in the class, I'll also be dictating a few questions to you. Only questions, not answers. I'll probably talk about what more points you need to put in the answers. But I'll be dictating a few questions to you from the mains point of view. Also, the past, uh, as I always say in the class, the previous year question papers are always very important. By previous years, I don't mean 10 years, I only mean the past four years. Okay. Now, uh, so I'll be also discussing most of the prelims questions which have appeared in your prelims examination in the past four years from history section. Okay. So uh, we'll do this much of exercise. We'll talk, we'll th put things in a point wise fashion. We'll look into certain prelims questions which have appeared before. I'll be discussing certain mains questions also which have appeared before and also dictating a few more to other, for few more to you. Okay. So that's something that we'll do. Now the first, let's say for the first uh, 25 minutes, let's do a brief overview in a timeline fashion from 1700s to 1947, where obviously I'm not going to explain anything, but I'm just going to point out which topics are important, which are important from the means perspective and which are important from the prelims perspective. Then as we move forward, we can take one one chunk and you'll know, okay, this much we've done. The next chunk is going to be this. Okay, so you'll have expectation lined out that okay, we've done this. The next is this. Okay, so so uh, yeah. Is is it everything is is that TV is working right now, right? Okay. Red, blue. Okay, so <coughs> if you see the whole period that we are going to cover, the first three or so classes we look at this period from 1700 to 1857. Okay, now this period from 1700 to 1857 is something that has been added in your syllabus since the syllabus changed from 2000. Uh, 1230 okay so this is a period which was not earlier included in modern indian history we used to begin modern indian history from uh, uh, from 1857 the first war of independence where we used to begin the modern indian history period and so this is a period which has been relatively newly added there has been two questions which have been asked before from this in the mains examination in the past four years and uh, this area continues to remain important only from the section of your prelims, from the main, only from the point of view of your mains examination. From the prelims examination point of view, this is not that important an area. But what is important here and what we'll be covering in greater detail, firstly, are the causes or the reasons for the decline of the Mughal Empire. Here, we start talking from the period of the death of Aurangzeb. We are not talking about the Mughal Empire. We will not talk about that. We will only see from the death of the last major Mughal Emperor and the reasons that precipitated the decline of the Mughal Empire. That is something important. A, a simultaneous, some of the most important battles which are associated with the decline of the Mughal Empire are the Battle of Plassey and the Battle of Baksar. Okay. So these are some of the battles, their significance, why did they break out, how are they related to the administration of Bengal, that is something that we'll talk about because these are some very key importantly defined battles of the 18th century and which also marked the arrival of British in India in a way. But that is something about the battle of Lassie and Baksar we'll see happened predominantly in Bengal. But two other, uh, you know, uh, another major state that we'll talk about is Hyderabad and in Hyderabad we'll talk about something that's called as the Anglo Carnatic Wars. We'll see that in 18th century India there were both the British and the French competing to establish their trading presence in India and this is what led to a number of wars. One of them were a series of wars which were called as the Anglo Carnatic Wars. So what led to the Anglo Carnatic Wars, what is their significance? Okay, and how did it impact India? All those things are important from the mains examination point of view. See, one more thing before we move any further, what is not important is remembering names and dates. 
Names and dates remembering is not important. They don't ask in the prelims and definitely not in the mains. In the prelims, there may be a question here and there on one important personality or the other, but they are relatively few. So you don't need to remember every name and date. Only the names and dates I tell you to remember, you need to remember. Beyond that, it's up to you. If you wish to, it's fine. Otherwise, it's okay. Okay. So just keep that in mind. In Hyderabad, we'll talk about the Anglo-Carnatic Wars. Then we'll talk about Mysore. And Mysore is also an important player in the 18th century India. And thus, we'll also talk about what are known as the Anglo-Mysore Wars. And what led to these wars and what is the significance of these wars? That is also something that is important. Finally, we'll talk about the Marathas. What were the characteristics of Marathas rule? There was a question that came in your mains examination and it asked in 2014 or 2015, the question was that why are so many battles fought in Panipat? Okay. So the rule of Marathas is associated predominantly with the third battle of Panipat. So uh, we'll talk about some general characteristics of the Marathas rule in India. How did they organize the structure of administration, etc. And how did uh, basically what was the significance of the third battle of Panipat and what led to the decline of the Marathas. Okay. All of these things are what are important. Okay. But if, if you have even the faintest idea of this period, you would know that it is not just Maratha and Hyderabad and uh, Bengal that was there. Okay, But there were other players also. There was Abad or what was UP or there were a number of other smaller regional states as well as for example, the, uh, the Rajputs were there or the Sikhs were there in Punjab. So, but we are not going to, into discuss, to discuss every princely ruler who existed in India. We are just looking at the major ones in this period and this is the period these are the topics which are important from the mains point of view now let's come to what is 1857 onwards from 1857 till 1947 what you will see is that the topics become important both for the prelims and the mains examination we'll now a question on 1857 and that was about the consequences of the war of 1857 and how did it impact 19th century India was asked in your mains examination in 2015. Okay, and it's a fairly simple question. One of the common patterns that you will see is for any topic that you're doing in history, what you need to know is what are the causes, the consequences, and the impact of any significant historical event. Okay, you don't need to know what exactly happened in the war, who killed whom, who attacked whom. All of those details of what happened in the war are not important. Nobody is going to ask you that what happened in this particular war. But what they are going to ask you is what is the significance of this war? Why this war happened? And how did it impact the society or the political structure of that time? Okay, so that is what they ask in the mains examination. So we'll see. Uh, so we'll see the causes and the consequences of the war of 1857 that's important both from the prelims and the mains point of view okay it's pretty important okay when we see and this uh, on the one side we say that this marks the establishment of direct british rule in india and so we'll see some topics which are exclusively important from the prelims point of view the british how did the british organize their army their judiciary or their police or their administrative structure. All of this, administrative structure, I mean the civil services. How did the British administer each of them or, you know, basically organize each of them? What were their characteristics? This is important from the prelims point of view. Okay. Exclusively, this is from the prelims point of view. Okay. Now, when we mark the arrival of British, another important thing that we'll talk about is the economic impact of British rule. 2015, they asked a question about the economic impact of British rule in India, which is again a fairly direct question that we obviously need to know. So the economic impact of British rule again is important. What was the economic impact? What were the reasons why the British were exploiting India? What is the matter manner? For example, this year, 2017, 
in your prelims examination, there was a question on the revenue settlement structure that the British had brought to India. So, for example, the Mahalwari, the Rayatwari, the permanent settlement systems, that these are revenue settlement systems that we talk about. So, this is something that is also important from the prelims point of view. So, what they ask in the prelims is, say they will ask, they will give a statement about a particular kind of a revenue settlement system and they'll say that with reference to the permanent settlement system in India, which of the following statements are correct or incorrect, okay. That is the kind of question that they will give in the prelims examination. The same thing they can ask in the mains examination. How? They'll say, what was the impact on agrarian society or rural society of these revenue settlement systems? So in the prelims they're asking, how did they collect the taxes? In the mains they're asking, what was the impact of this collection of taxes on the rural agrarian structure? So what I'm saying is the same thing can be twisted slightly to ask both in the prelims as well as in the mains examination. We'll talk about other economic aspects as well and so this is a very important topic both for prelims plus mains. This is only for prelims. This is also for prelims plus means okay so one should have that understanding before you actually you know reading any topic what to expect and what to know from this particular topic now apart from the revenue settlement systems uh, and the economic impact what we are also going to talk about is something that's called as social reforms okay for example you will see the people like ramon roy Okay, or uh, the Brahmo Samaj or the RA Samaj, a number of such organizations which were formed. And these social reform organizations argued for bringing in social change in India. Okay, the contribution of these social reformers who formed, and here you need to remember names, especially for your prelims. Which organization, major organization was formed by which individual and what was the objective this organization was seeking to achieve. For example, who formed the RA Samaj? What was the objectives RA Samaj was seeking to achieve and what were its ideas? They are important from the prelims point of view. So, for example, so basically, uh, key organizations, who were their founders and what were the objectives? This is important from the prelims point of view. What is important from the mains point of view for the same topics is what, how effective were these social reformers, what kind of changes they argued for, were they able to achieve the changes that they aim to bring about and also comparative questions that we'll talk about later, let's not get into questions but an assessment of how effective these social reform movements were is something that is important from the means examination point of view okay so again you see the same pattern they'll ask you that with reference to R.S. Samaj which of the following statements are correct it was formed by Dayanand Saraswati it argued for this 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 they'll give three statements and they'll ask you A, A, B, A, B, C none of the above okay so that is a prelims kind of question in the means they'll ask the same thing to what extent R.S. Samaj was able to effectively contribute to social reform movements in India or to social reform in India during the 19th century so what you understand the same thing can be twisted to ask both in the prelims and in the mains examination. So an assessment, this is something that is important predominantly from the mains perspective. So the social reform topics are important and you'll, you'll see that they're frequently asked in your prelims examination as well. Okay. Now, apart from this, uh, the next thing that you should look at, you know, all of this, apart from this, we talk about the formation of the Congress, right? Finally, from 1885, we talk about the formation of the Congress. Why was the Congress formed? With what objectives it was formed? What were the differences within the Congress? That is something that is important to know at the background. Not many direct questions are asked that what were the differences between the different sections of the Congress initially, okay? But we should definitely know why the Congress was formed and all of these things. But a more important topic is the partition of Bengal. Why was Bengal partitioned in 1905? What were the reasons for the partitions and what happened after this? Okay, so we'll see that there are a number of events which happened after this, uh, including the 1906 session of the Congress 
I'm not describing what is happening, what happened in that, but I'm just telling you. The 1906, the 1907 session of the Congress, and also the 1909 reforms. Prelims plus mains, but more for the prelims, or rather, let's put it more important for the prelims than for the mains. But yes, important for the mains as well. That what is happening in these sessions and what what is the significance of what is happening in these sessions? Okay, that's something that we need to know because that's the direct outcome of the partition of Bengal. We'll talk about that, but just you know, keep a point on this. Next, and. Uh, once let me complete this and whenever after that if you have any doubts you want to ask anything we can talk about that as well also one of the major reasons why i don't dictate is so that we can have enough time and space for addressing questions so feel free to ask anything you want me to repeat anything just raise your hand you know we can go over one thing as many times as needed given that we have that time span to do so now after 1885 that's all in the partition of Bengal in 1905. The first thing that we'll talk about is the period from World War I around. Or the period from, let's say, not just World War I, the period from 1910 to 1917. This is the period where we we'll talk about a number of things. For example, the Home Rule Leagues. Or, for example, a number of other things like the Gadar Party, the Lucknow Pact. Arrival of Gandhi in India. And ultimately the non-cooperation movement of 1921. So all these, these are some key themes. You know, what was the objectives of the Home Rule Leagues? They asked as simple questions of like, who formed the Home Rule League and what were the objectives of the Home Rule League in the prelims examination. Okay. So, or... Uh, what was the significance of the Lucknow Pact? Also, is a simple question that they ask in the prelims examination. Also, uh, very important from the prelims examination is also the key movements that Gandhi, you know, undertook after coming to India. Also, in the same place, let me tell you something that is exclusively and important only from the main examination is the Gandhian period in South Africa. This is something that is important only from the means examination point of view. Okay, Gandhian period in South Africa. What he did in South Africa is very important from the means point of view. And one thing, let me tell you, anything and everything about Gandhi that you can lay your hands on and read should be done. Without Gandhi, UPSC will not happen. It will not happen. You will face him everywhere from polity to economy to history to social issues to ethics. Ethics though... Okay. So, Gandhi is definitely going to be one of your key pillars. And to that extent, one should know everything about Gandhi. And definitely, history is one place where you talk about him in much detail. They have asked questions like this in your main examination. What would have been the shape of freedom struggle if Gandhi would not have been there? Okay. So, Gandhi is important. Let's you know just, just put that in your mind. And for example, just like Gandhi, another thing that is important both for history as well as for your GS is women. I mean, they are important for the nation as well, but nonetheless, for UPSC definitely they are. In the sense that no, no year goes where you don't see a question either on Gandhi and on women. Both of them come every year in your examination in different avatars. Okay, So, that is why even here, here we will see that exclusively for the mains examination, there are a number of topics related to women and their contribution to the freedom struggle which is very important. Okay. So, uh, this much is there. Then, in the period from 1920s to the 1930s, you will see, uh, for example, the period of militant nationalism or also called as revolutionary terrorism, the period of Bhagat Singh, HRA, the Hindustan Republican Association or HSRA, the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. All of this is important, more so from, and this is important, in, the, in terms of getting an understanding, we'll talk about how it can be applied in both prelims and mains later. Also, there is two very important things here, 1928 and 29. 28 is the Nehru report. 
and 29 is the Congress Lahore session which talks about Purna Swaraj. So, so I'm not getting into that, but these sessions are very important, especially from prelims point of view. Okay. Now, apart from this, also what you will see is that we will talk about that 1931 is when we will talk about the civil disobedience movement. So, what were the reasons for the movement, etc. We should know. They don't ask a direct question. See, they don't ask questions like this in the main examination anymore. That what was the non, what were the causes for the non-cooperation movement and what was its impact? They don't ask such question. They were asked in the ninth class. Okay, that what was non-cooperation, why, why non-cooperation happened, what was its impact. They ask those questions about these things, because you don't read these things. Uh, I mean, not these things, uh, the first portion, the 1700 to 1857, I thought that's still written there. So, the 1700 to 1857 portion, they still ask these kind of questions. Otherwise, direct questions about why non-cooperation happened, why civil disobedience happened, why quit India happened, they don't ask in the main examination. They'll ask a different kind of a question that we'll talk later. So simplistic questions like direct cause and effect for these major events, they don't ask. They ask for fringe events. What are those fringe events? We'll talk about that. So the civil disobedience movement, you know, why was this breaking out and all of this? Uh, is something that we need to know. But also something that we need to know in the 1930s is the Gandhi Ambedkar debates. They've asked this before in your mains examination that what were the differences of opinion in political ideas and ideologies between Gandhi and Ambedkar. So the Gandhi Ambedkar debates are ex extremely important for the mains examination. They asked a question in 2015 about comparison between Gandhi and Ambedkar. 2016 they asked a question of comparison between Gandhi and Nehru. So some of those comparisons between key political leaders are important from the mains examination. Because I am telling you, Gandhi has to come. Every year you will see something or the other related to Gandhi. Okay. So one year they ask what would have been the shape of freedom struggle if Gandhi is not there. The next year they are asking you to compare Gandhi and Ambedkar. This does not mean every other political leader can be compared with every other. Okay. There are only a few comparisons which have already been made. You are not going to make a new comparison in 8 minutes in 250 words in the answer which has not been done by historians before. So only those comparisons which have been done are the ones we'll discuss. We'll not let our imaginations go wild and think about all kinds of comparison that could happen between, say, Jinnah and, you know, uh, Jinnah and Nehru or Jinnah and Bose and Bose and this, that, or Gandhi and Tilak. No such comparisons have been done by historians. So we're not a historian. Okay. So that's there. Now, uh, also, apart from this thing, you know, but, so also we'll talk about two very important things. The Pune Pact and a series of round table conferences here that happened. Now the round table conferences themselves are not very important but why was the Pune Pact happening, what were the reasons for the Pune Pact etc is important. Okay. Now uh, let's come to the period from 1935 to 1946-47. Now what is happening in this period is very very important both for the prelims and the main extremely important period why because of two reasons by the time you come to this period you are wanting freedom to happen so you're like book ka end aa gaya hai khatam kar dete hai. okay so you often are you do not pay that kind of attention to this period and they've asked many questions from this period both in the prelims and the main examination okay first thing itself is the government of india act 1935 what was this act about? What were the characteristics of this act? That is something that is important from the prelims examination point of view. Okay. So they've asked questions on the Government of India Act 1935 in your prelims examination. They've also asked a question in the mains examination also on the same act of what was its contribution, what was its significance to the Indian constitution itself. So this is, this is the act itself is important from your prelims as well as the mains examination. Then we'll see that the Congress formed a government in 1937, okay? We often don't read about this, but for 28 months, Congress was in power in a number of states in India in 1937. So to what extent, what was the performance of Congress during these 28 months of rule from 1937 onwards is something that is important only for the mains examination, okay? So the performance of Congress during 28 months of rule, one should know why, because this has not been asked ever before, but this can definitely be asked in the future 
okay so we'll talk in brief about that as well also the period from 1939 onwards you will see that uh, we talk about vardha and how from 1940 onwards you will see that there were a number of committees that were sent by the british this was in 1940 was the august of a, then you have uh, the crips mission then you have the quit india movement then after this you will have a number of other things for example like the wevel plan the cabinet mission plan etc okay till 1946 then finally you have the mount batten plan 1947 and then you have independence okay now what you will see is that the crips mission the august offer the wevel plan the cabinet mission plan or the mount batten plan all of this is important for prelims examination point of view okay what each of these committees are talking about not details but very simple and very superficial things what was the major thing that these committees are offering that is what you need to know they were asked as simple questions in your prelims examination is it not visible is it visible not visible now it's visible any in the back is it visible not visible you have a problem with my handwriting many people have had in history before is it is it visible okay so another thing that is there is that is important they were asked as simple questions in your prelims examination that the quit india movement was launched due to the failure of august offer crips offer wevel plan cabinet mission plan okay so you need to know here chronologically what led to another and why one was failing this is important for your prelims examination on all of this okay all of these but this is something that is important from your prelims point of view i said that this is a period very important from the mains point of view as well right in this period when we what we talk about mains point of view is a number of things which are happening for example around 1945 okay one is the you see that 1942 onwards you see the formation you will see that the ina was formed now the ina itself did not achieve something substantial but what happened after that was that a number of these soldiers were captured and this led to the ina trials okay uh, at the hands of the british they were also making making a movie on this uh, which is supposed to be released i think in this coming month or the next month uh, and it's sponsored by the uh, funded by the rajya sabha tv so i mean the and they asked questions on ina trials before many a times in the mains examination and there they asked the question of what was the significance of the ina trials okay and the ina trials also provoked something later that was called the royal indian navy mutiny they also asked the question on what was the royal indian navy mutiny and what was the significance to the indian freedom struggle because when we read history we don't read about these things in greater detail so here they were asked simpler questions of what are what what led to these events and what was the consequence or the significance of these events so ina trials during mutiny have been repeatedly asked in your mains examination extremely important okay so that is uh, there now uh, also apart from all of this uh, also what is important is the whole aspect of communalism and partition they asked a question in your mains examination or oh, for example they asked a question in your mains examination in 2015 asking that was the partition inevitable do you think that the partition was inevitable i am not asking you okay i am just saying that this is what they asked in the question do you think the partition was inevitable or when did it become inevitable etc okay so what what is communalism how did it affect india these all things are important there's another reason why they they asked this question and they will continue to ask this question in the future as well uh, maybe uh, not directly but indirectly because bipin chandra that you all read his own major contribution original his own original research to modern indian history is understanding of communalism during colonial india and post colonial india both so that is why this topic of colonial communalism is important for your 
mains examination point of view apart from these things there are certain more fringe areas which are important exclusively from the mains examination point of view and there are number of questions for mains examination that can come combining world history and modern indian history for example the vast questions like how did the russian revolution impact post independence economic planning so we'll talk about many international linkages also here how did world war 1 impact the indian freedom struggle how did world war 2 impact the indian freedom struggle because this whole period of 1939 to 45 is when the world war is happening right it's not a coincidence that india gets independence in 47 and the world war ends in 45 it's not a coincidence they are very deeply interconnected so how so because this is what allows them to ask both world history and modern indian history in one question and this is what students don't do they don't connect everybody knows why non cooperation happened why civil disobedience happened okay so they will basically want to question you on things which basically want you to interlink a few things together so a number of those things will also come from in the main examination we'll talk but some other areas for example i told you women women in the past 5 years they've asked thrice a question on women's contribution to indian freedom struggle that some frequency that's not been repeated i think it's unparalleled except gandhi in indian history and upsc obviously so uh, in the sense that you will see that they have asked three kind of questions this year 2016 mains examination they asked the question that discuss the contribution of women in the gandhian phase of the freedom struggle they have asked the question in 2013 about the contribution of women organizations not women women organizations to the indian freedom struggle okay also another question third that remains that remains is a question on contribution of women to the militant phase of freedom struggle because we all know about bhagat singh and all that so they don't ask about what was the contribution of militant nationalism to the indian freedom struggle they ask about what was the contribution of women to the militant phase of the freedom struggle okay so that's also something that is definitely a very high value area a general question also can be asked is what is the contribution of women to the indian freedom struggle that has also been asked Okay. but that does not mean a question which has been asked before cannot be asked again they can modify it and ask again so women related issues are important for example 90 2017 is when uh, our commemoration was held for the formation of the women india association it was formed in 1917 100 years of women india association were celebrated the prime minister or the president issued a few commemorative stamps also in the names of some of these people you know freedom women freedom fighters so it's important it's it's not something that can be sidelined another important topic specifically from the main examination is the contribution of freedom fighters from north east india north east india people don't know about today especially people from north and south india north east india does not exist in the consciousness but forget that beyond that if we don't know about today we definitely don't know about what was the contribution to of there to the freedom struggle Now the government of India, at seven, celebrating 70 years of independence, released a special booklet, for, uh, you know, uh, pointing out the contribution of freedom fighters from northeast to the Indian freedom struggle. Future questions will definitely come from there because Gandhi ka contribution, Bose ka contribution, Ambedkar ka contribution, everybody knows beyond a point who has studied. But you will miss out on these fringe areas. Okay, extremely important from the. main examination point of view they can possibly ask even names of some of these freedom fighters in your prelims examination as well now the last thing that i'm not writing but i'm just telling you also is important is the role of the working class to the indian freedom struggle working class and the capitalist class to the indian freedom struggle okay because how did the labor parties or the labor unions and the indian capitalist class they contributed to the freedom struggle this is also important okay now why i am telling you this because these are relatively more fringe areas that you will never study directly on your own but are very important and you will see they are asking most of the questions from here in your mains examination now having said that the next thing that so this completes you know broadly what it does not be so not a very comprehensive list but it's a good pointer of what all we are going to cover we're going to cover more than this but yeah this much to obviously the next important thing that you need you will obviously come jo our subject mind mein aata hai what are the sources right what books are you going to read so what books are you going to read is not very difficult to understand because no you're not going to read many at least for modern indian history you're not going to read many books i'll say 
first thing is that you 101% have to do is stick to the ppt why or stick to what we do in the class and the ppt read it line by line okay it's very condensed okay and it is it is very condensed is that give it is it, it, it's very condensed and uh, also at the same point of time it is something that is kept need keeping in mind not just your understanding but what can you write in answers how you can write in answers okay so that's something that you will not find in books but then having said that it is not a product of my imagination it's just something that i've taken from a number of books and put together in a point wise format for you so don't go book hunting okay so that's something that you don't need to do so whatever is there in the market whatever you need to read i've already compiled that from a number of books okay bipin chandra shekhar bandopadhyay sumit sarkar whatever books that you can you would have heard of okay so <coughs> okay <laughs> okay they couldn't understand or it's not legible okay so we'll address this in the future that probably what i'm writing i'm writing in a better fashion so that the online students can also read my under right handwriting i mean since the school days my teachers told me your handwriting is pathetic i'll definitely improve on that <laughs> and so that ensure that nobody misses out in terms of what you know uh, especially the online students you don't miss out okay so uh so what i was saying was in terms of sources you refer to the ppt that's a 101% must but yes everybody wants to complement it with somebody something so either you stick to the vision print out material the vision print out material is also a compilation of books only okay what is relevant so either you stick to the vision print out material but some of you are more you know uh, in the sense that you want to read a book a proper book book per se right so there are two options first is bipin chandra's not now bipin chandra himself comes in various shapes and sizes today right you have bipin chandra's struggle for independence india's till independence bipin chandra's india till independence this is by penguin the blue colored book right and so in case you have not seen its face before i'll show you both the forms which are available and which you can refer to so this blue one this blue one is what i'm saying is not that you need to buy need to buy or read why because it's a thicker one it's almost runs into 400 pages it's not required unless until you are a history optional whatever is relevant from there has been covered in the class a relatively briefer one uh is the other one this india's struggle for independence this is by i think uh, okay this is also by penguin only which is publishing it which i think no this is also they would uh, release a new version of it okay no there's also 600 pages who's going to read 600 pages of history i mean they have a smaller version by orion black swan yes this one if you want to buy one thing as a book this is a good source okay Bipin Chandra's History of Modern India. This is relatively smaller number of pages. I think, I think it's relatively smaller pages, and uh, it's much thinner. So you can read this. Okay. Now, having said that, this is one of the books that you can refer to. There is another book, and that is everybody knows about it. Spectrum, right? Spectrum is like what life boils down to after a period of time. Right? This is what one would want life to be. but then it boils down to a spectrum over a period of time okay so spectrum is something which is basically a gist of bipin chandra it's a summary of bipin chandra the thick bipin chandra so you can refer to spectrum as well spectrum has also got some additional information for your prelims examination some key names etc so either you read this or you read spectrum you don't don't read both 
don't need to read both of them because that is essentially a summary of the thick Bipin Chandra. Okay, and this is also a derivative of the big Bipin Chandra only. So don't read both, stick to one of them. Okay, and just my understanding is you stick to the class notes and the printout, the vision printout material. If you want a book, either this or Spectra. Okay, just stick to one of them. As far as the NCRT of Bipin Chandra's goes, the old NCRT, new NCRT, the NCRTs will give you a brief understanding. Okay, they'll give you the story, they'll give you the plot, but they'll not give you the details that you need for your prelims or the mains examination. So NCRTs is not a substitute and it is not the go-to source. It's definitely something that will give you a bird's eye view, but not a detailed in-depth view. So you can't rely on the NCRT alone. Okay. So that's why I'm saying you want to buy one book, either this or Spectrum Modern Indian History is what you buy. Apart from that, there are other books also like Shekhar Bandhapadhyaya, Plasi to Partition. Okay. And Plasi to Partition is a good book and it's a very good book in fact. And But you don't need to read it because of two reasons, unless until you're a history of the student. Secondly, it's English is... It's written in core academic language, okay, so you don't need to read it. And whatever is relevant portion from there, I've already incorporated in the PPT, okay. So you don't need to go hunting for that as well. So don't go book hunting is the, is the take home message from this. Just stick to the printouts and uh, the vision printout material and the classroom or the classroom and you want to complement it with the books. So these are the options. Now let's start with something that we do for the first time today and the first part of the topic and that is the decline of the Mughal Empire. Any doubts still here? Any, any more queries still here? Fine? Okay. Yeah, so the first thing that we'll talk about today is the decline of the Mughal Empire. Just a second, I'll just take out the PPT so that uh, I can show something of significance. How many of you are engineers? Oh my God. How many of you, that, that's a, it's a wrong question. How many of you are not engineers? <laughs> not, not. How oh, you are not engineers? How many are engineers? Oh, the class is almost half split. Good, nice. So, uh, and uh, okay, so before we get into anything, thoda tha, thoda tha ek brief familiarization bhi ho jana I have deep regard for engineers because engineers make you feel that anything and everything is possible in life. <laughs> yes, it, it's, they are symbolic of India's true potential that it can be morphed in any direction. Okay? And that you are never too old to begin anything new. In the sense, 23, you begin a new life to UPSC, 22, maybe, or you do an MBA, 25, you begin another new life after doing an MBA. F five years down the line, you realize that this is no more what I want to do and you begin another new career life, professional life. So engineers make you feel that life can always be dynamic. Okay? So that's, that's something definitely about engineers. Let's come to the non-engineers. How many of you are from the social sciences? Okay. Social sciences today, anyway, as you can see in this class also, is an endangered species. Okay. In the sense that social people who take social sciences, firstly, are not respected in the society. They are like, why are you doing social sciences? Secondly, when they have done social sciences and they start asking questions, then people say, this is the reason you should not have done social sciences. Okay. So I have deep regard for social sciences as well, but for different reasons. But another third, another so, uh, and uh, okay, let's not talk about the third group. How many of you are doctors? Okay. Okay. So doctors anyway don't take too much to UPSC, but when they do, they, doctors is another breed. I mean, then doctors are one thing, okay. Doctors is like, you give them something, you give them books and you give them a table and they'll keep doing that. They'll slog it and slog it and slog it. That's all they know. But one thing common between doctors and engineers is that they do not have a vision before they enter UPSC. They don't know anything. They have no sense of history. They have no sense of geography. 
they definitely have no sense of politics okay they don't know anything they're like blank okay you tell them we should kill we should give a lesson to china let's do this <laughs> right so they have no sense of history okay and they have no sense of politics and so this is the reason why they have no vision as such but they have the skills you go to the social sciences people you have a lot of vision they'll tell you what is wrong with everything but then people will say you can only tell what is wrong you should either do something about it or stop cribbing right so often what you will find is that people who have vision may not have the appropriate skills people who have the skills have no vision what is more dangerous not having skills or not having vision how many think not having skills how many think not having a vision okay so that's why we say technological progress unless and until it's guided by a vision turns out to be a bigger disaster so in the sense that you'll see for that's what oppenheimer said when the nuclear bomb was invented that it's a product of science it's a product of technology it's a product of application or skill but that is what skill without vision can do to you right so in that sense what you should be doing is that especially the technical people take the vision from here people who already have the vision which anyways are few in the class i'm presuming social science no these are generalization generalizations don't apply to everybody if you are exception and you know you are feel good about it but if you're not be in sure be in, you know try to mix both of these things together when you are able to bring vision and skills together that is what upsc is ideally supposed to be ideally life mein nothing is ideal but nonetheless that is what upsc is supposed to do in this preparation you get a vision you don't get any skills you just get a vision once you become an officer you get the training to get the skills if you are able to marry both of them together it's a ideal marriage just like i said there's nothing ideal but you can try and come as close to it as possible and history gives you that only history just gives you vision history tells you that what you think is happening for the very first time is definitely not that it's happening for the first time rather it has happened many a times in the world before so it is not that revolution happened in india with independence it happened in france also with the french revolution it happened in america also with the american revolution and many a times you'll see the revolutions over a period of time after a few decades or so do not seem to be that revolutionary when you're living in that moment you feel oh this is amazing this is the change in india needed i remember 2010 11 people said india against corruption this is the change people need Now, this is the fight against corruption but those who have a sense of history would know this has happened before for example when the surgical strikes happened now right and it's like how can you question the army or the government whether the strikes really did happen or not or whether it was happened for the first time they don't know those who would ask those who, those who say that one should not even ask this question don't know many a times in world history you will see wars have been triggered when army generals have lied to their political administration or the political administration has lied to its people the breakdown of the iraq war was one of the examples where it was said you you thinking ki main kyon bol raha hu ek reason hai sabke piche okay for example the breakout of the iraq war happened why it happened because it was said that iraq has weapons of mass destruction but it didn't the vietnam war happened because of a reason that the us population and the us parliament was told that the war is breaking out because vietnam has attacked united states navy but later 10 years later it was revealed nothing of this ever happened so you will see that questioning in history history tells you that if you are not questioning you are setting yourself up for a disaster and that is what our education system as well as our family teaches us not to question right you would ask your parents why did this happen they like I mean, you don't need to put that question. Why should I do this only? They're like, question. You going to question us? Right? So you become, you've grown up that much that you can now question your elders. Right? Question them. 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 Question them.
mains examination point of view. Now, the first thing that we are going into is the reasons for the decline of the Mughal Empire important from the mains examination. But a bit of context here is important firstly to understand because we are not talking about Akbar and all of those things. Okay, We are just starting from the death of Aurangzeb. But a brief understanding of how the Mughals functioned is important. See, the Mughals rule started in India or the centralized Mughal rule lasted in India for a period of roughly 300 years. Okay, And this is from the, you know, uh, one could say from the 15th century to the 18th century. Okay, Centralized Mughal rule. They were elements or the predecessors of Mughals who were there, etc. and the successors. But you are saying centralized Mughal rule. And this was... The, the two major Mughal emperors who are associated with expanding the Mughal empire are firstly Akbar and secondly is Aurangzeb. Okay. Yes, Babur and all others also played a role, we are not getting into that. But what you see for example in this map is the area, the area in pink is the territorial extent of the Mughal empire till the time of Akbar. The next major phase of territorial expansion of the Mughal empire is the area in blue the Deccan region as it's called, is the area which was brought under the control of the Mughal Empire by Aurangzeb. Now Aurangzeb was in in charge was in, in, in charge of the Mughal rule for a period of from 1650 or 1658 to be more precise till 1707. Aurangzeb dies in 1707 and that is what we say is the uh, Aurangzeb is also called as the last great Mughal emperor. He is not being called great because he is actually great. He is being called great because he is a major Mughal emperor who basically was the one who brought the Mughal empire to its zenith territorially. Or territorially it was the Mughal empire which was at its peak under Aurangzeb. And Aurangzeb was also responsible for a number of wars that he fought in the Deccan region from the 1670s to the 1700s. Okay, Almost for 25 years, 30 years, he was fought fighting a number of wars in the Deccan region. And so what is happening in the Deccan region is that he fights a number of wars. One of some of the major opponents, one of the major opponents of the uh, Mughals in the Deccan region were the Marathas. Okay. And the Marathas were one of the major uh, adversaries of the Mughals. Though Aurangzeb was successful ultimately in subduing Shivaji and uh, you know subduing Shivaji and ultimately subduing the Marathas and furthering his control over the Deccan region, these were vastly expensive wars that he fought. And these were wars which fought, were, went on for decades altogether. So this is you know a long and arduous journey to bring the Deccan region under the control of the Mughals. And thus it is said that it is the Mughal empire in recent history before the British in recent history, I am not saying for example the Guptas were there or the Mauryas were there, they also were bigger powers. But in recent history before the British, the major pan-Indian empire in 17th century India were the Mughals. The 1600s saw Mughals becoming almost a pan-Indian empire. This is almost like Akhand Bharat in the sense that it is standing from the portions of Afghanistan to almost the portions of South India. So this is a pan-Indian empire that the Mughals had established and this is the significance of the Mughals that we will see that after Mughals there were a number of, after the centralized Mughal rule there were a number of successor Mughal states or a number of smaller other states for example like Hyderabad, like Mysore, like Maratha, like Awadh like Bengal, but none of them had a pan-India reach and it is only the British who now next become the next major pan-Indian empire. So that's just a context. Okay. Now one thing also, I mean, uh, what you will see is that if you get this much, what you will see is that after the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, after the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, what you see is that by 1757, the Mughal Empire comes to end. The central Mughal rule, I am not saying Mughal Empire, I am saying the centralized Mughal rule comes to an end in 1757. So what do you see? That in a span of 50 years, you are seeing a decline of the central Mughal Empire. But the Mughal Empire, I said, is reaching its peak in 1707. And the Mughal Empire has been in India almost for 300 years, almost for 250 to 300 years. So what is it? What is the reason that a 
an empire which has lasted for three centuries and suddenly over a span of the next 50 years collapses. Often, what we often talk about is that Aurangzeb was an important ruler and was an important player in the administration. He was a powerful king and the death of Aurangzeb led to a number of political disputes basically which led to the fall of the empire. But this is what you need to understand. The first takeaway from the first class and for life in general also is individuals have played an important role in history. But from UPSC point of view and also from a general understanding of history point of view, what you need to know whenever you're looking at causes is not just individual level explanations or what did Aurangzeb do or not do, but also what were the underlying political and economic reasons. Whenever I'm talking and you'll see for whatever period we are talking, wherever we are talking in history, whenever I'm talking about causes, I'll divide it into four categories and you are supposed to do this as well for your answer writing. The first category is political causes, the second category is economic causes, the third is socio-religious and the fourth category is the causes related to the army. Okay, that's it. These are the four major categories in which we look into the causes for the decline of the Mughals. Not simplistically just to say that Aurangzeb was a strong ruler, he was no longer there and so the empire collapsed. Okay. So, for example, the collapse of the BJP is not, uh, the collapse of the Congress has not happened because Indira Gandhi is not there or Rajiv Gandhi is not there. It's because of the rot within the party. The absence of a strong leader has just precipitated matters. Okay. So, in a similar manner, the rot within Aurangzeb within the Mughal Empire was already there. It was, but it was the death of Aurangzeb which precipitated matters. Okay, so it was a tipping point in a way, not the reason itself. So when we talk about the reasons, what is to be understood, and you can draw this with me. Reasons for decline. And I'll improve my writing. Reasons for decline of Mughal Empire. This is me at my best, okay? I can't write better than this. Reasons for the decline of Mughal Empire. Now, when we, as I told you, that when we talk about reasons, we'll divide it into categories. There's a reason why I explain it in this manner is because this is what you can actually do in an answer, not beyond this. You can't go beyond this in an answer. Okay. Now, when we talk about reasons, the first category of reasons that let's talk about is the political category. Now, political category of reasons we'll see uh, are many. Okay. And one of the first reasons for, or the political reasons is the fact that yes, Aurangzeb fought a number of expensive wars what we say that Aurangzeb fought a number of expensive wars in the Deccan region and was responsible for the expansion. But almost for three or four decades that he fought these wars, these were hugely expensive wars. Okay, And these wars that he fought basically were the major reasons why the government was spending more than it was raising Okay, in terms of expanding into these areas. But then you would think the first question that would come to mind is why is Aurangzeb so hellbent on expanding into the Deccan? Why is he seeking to do so? Why? Why do you think? Any ideas? Why is he so hellbent on expanding into the Deccan? Because for because of revenue. Any any other ideas? Exports, why are see anything else? Mineral resources. Mineral resources. See, essentially what you need to understand uh, that exports, minerals, etc. are not a major component of economy at this point of time. The major driver of economy at this point of time predominantly, I'm not saying only, I'm saying predominantly is agriculture. The more and the major source of revenue for the state was agriculture. And if agriculture was a major source of revenue for the state, and taxing agriculture was a major source of revenue for the state. The more land you had under your control, meaning more agricultural area is what you have under your control, meaning you can tax more land and can generate more revenue. So it is correct to say that his drive to expand was definitely motivated by economic reasons. I'm not saying only by economic reasons, but definitely was motivated by economic concerns because that would basically bring in more areas under, under their control and increasing the revenue base of the empire. 
So basically these wars were being fought apart from other reasons also primarily for expanding the revenue base of the empire by bringing more areas under the control of the central Mughal rule. Okay. That was there. But the problem with this expansion became was not that they wanted to bring more areas under their control. The Mughal Empire was truly an expansionary government or an expansionary state. In 18th century India and 18th century world itself, the constant focus of empires all over the world was to expand. Expand and expand in their sizes further. Why? Because the major source of economy was taxing agriculture, generating revenue and more land you had more revenue you could generate. So, But the problem was that this expansion proved to be more costly than the kind of revenue that could be generated from the Deccan region. We'll see, uh, I mean this is what I'm telling you, is that it costed an amount say 1000 crores to expand into these areas by fighting constant wars. I'm just giving you a random figure. But the revenue that could be generated by taxing agriculture here would be somewhere in the tune of 700 crores or 800 crores. So in a net, in a nutshell, fighting these expensive wars, though was meant to increase the revenue base of the, of the empire, it actually weakened the Mughals financially. It, were, it was expensive to fight these wars over such a long period of time. And you will see this is not just happening again, as I told you, never, mm, very few things happen in history for the very first time. This is not the first time an empire is fighting wars which are more expensive than the kind of revenue it can generate from there. This is not a mistake that only Aurangzeb is committed. The British, the French committed the same mistake. Okay, we'll see that later. That the French committed the same, have committed the same mistake before, the British have committed the same mistake before. Okay, so the first reason is politically that they fought a number of expensive wars in the Deccan which basically financially impaired or financially ruined the Mughal Empire. But that's one of the political reasons. The other major political reason is political succession disputes that happened after the death of Aurangzeb. We'll see. I'm just explaining it to you. This is the timeline which is there in the PPT as well and I'll take you through the first PPT so that you get a sense of how do you we go about it. See, we'll see that in the PPT also you'll see that after Aurangzeb, you don't need to mark this up, but I'm just telling it to you for your understanding. After Aurangzeb died in 1707, you, you will see that by 1719, for the, you will see that a number of Mughal empires, Mughal emperors are assassinated, counter assassinated, replaced by another member from the Mughal nobility. This is like the Indian version of Game of Thrones. 1700 to 1857 is Indian Game of Thrones. Okay, So you will see uh, in this period that you will see that a number of rulers came to, to power. So uh, you had for example Muhammad, uh, you at the very last from 1719 to 1748 you had by the name of somebody by the name of Muhammad Shah. Why? Why did he come to power? We will know that Muhammad Shah came to power. I'm going opposite in the sense that Muhammad Shah came to power because there was somebody who was a Mughal emperor by the name of Farooq Siyar. Farooq Siyar was assassinated by some of the nobles within the Mughal court and after assassinating the Mughal emperor Farooq Siyar, they brought Muhammad Shah to the throne. And Muhammad Shah was on the throne from 1720 to 1748. For the next 28 years, after 1720, you see Muhammad Shah being there on the throne. But before him was Farooq Siyar and Farooq Siyar was there from 1713 to 1719. Okay. Farooq Siyar was assassinated by the Sayyid brothers. Okay. Who were these Sayyid brothers? We'll talk about that in a minute to give you a sense. But you just, you know, this is just to firstly complete. Then, but before Far Farooq Siyar, who installed, but before Farooq Siyar, also there was somebody by the name of So, there, there was Jahandar Shah and Jahandar Shah himself was overthrown by Farooq Siyar, but this Farooq Siyar fellow himself is being assassinated by the Sayyid brothers. And 
then what happens is that after 1719 though the sayyid brothers have placed muhammad shah on the throne there are another series of fellows and these are these go by the name of the by he goes by the name of asaf jahan one asaf jahan one and asaf jahan one is also the one it is also the individual who is called nizam ul mulk later he is called nizam ul mulk but i'm telling it to you so that you know who is called who so this fellow asaf jahan one he gets the sayyid brothers assassinated after the sayyid brothers get mohammad shah installed on the throne so why do you need to know all of this you don't need to know all of this in detail who killed whom who was whose brothers who was whose sister all of that is there to satisfy your curiosity in the ppt but why is this while this is happening what is the take away from here that till 1707 you have one centralized mughal ruler but then over a period of time of the next 10 years you have three or four major mughal emperors being replaced in a span of 10 years this is like india during the 1990s right where you had from 1995 to 2003 government changing in 5 years okay. so that kind of a political instability is something that is not very beneficial for any empire definitely not for the mughal empire who were facing a constant threat also from the marathas okay the marathas were still trying to organize themselves and push against the mughals again and there was a constant threat that was being faced now the question is not to understand the first thing is that there is political instability the second thing to understand is another reasons for this political instability one of the things that you see is that a number of nobles in the mughal court are the ones who are also getting their kings assassinated replaced by somebody else and then there is also rivalry between different members of the mughal court themselves so this political instability is fueled by something that's called and before we get into any further details we need to understand this we'll put that everything together and we'll write it together don't worry uh that this political instability is also being fueled by something that is called as the structure that is inherent to the structure of mughal administration and that is that mughals started expanding into india from the areas of borders of afghanistan to wherever they went and the and you will see that you know when the mughals had within the mughal court we will have to look into this a uh, bit of the structure also so you will see that there was a king okay below the king there were a number of members of the nobility okay members of the nobility meaning those who are relatives to the king who have descended from the king or are now descendants of the descendants of the king the sector etc now so what do you see that there were these are also which are called as the ruling elite turani t u r a n i turani i r a n i irani and the third is hindustani turani irani and hindustani these were all people who were a member of the ruling elite or the nobility as it is called now what were these three major groups within the mughal ruling elite or the mughal court as we say see the idea is we often think that anybody who conquers a particular area you know establishes a new rule there that this was a area under mughal rule basically meaning that mughals were coming and now they were ruling throughout india that's the impression that you get right when i say that this is the area of mughal rule but that is not what how it turned out to be or how it ever was in the sense that wherever the mughals went and expanded into they did not replace the old elites or the old rulers rather they incorporated the old rulers within their court even the british in many areas they incorporated a number of erstwhile princely rulers within their courts it is never a very good strategy to replace the old elites by new elites from outside because what will happen the old elites will not sit quietly they will lead a rebellion from time to time to try and overthrow the outside elites okay and to that extent the mughals understood this so when Uh, so the origin the, the mughals or the direct descendants of the mughals who were the first founders were the 
people of the Turani faction. The Turani faction were the people who had relations to Turkey or what is also what was also called as the Ottoman Empire. Okay. So they were the members of the Turani faction. When they were expanding into and those who had relations to the Persians and were the descendants of the Persians and were members of the Mughal court, they were called as the Iranians. Persian means Iranian. There's also the Shia Sunni thing that's there. Turanis are the Sunnis, Iranis are the Shias. Okay, but I'm just telling it to you. Then comes the Hindustani faction. The Hindustani, now when the expansion was happening into India, a number of local elites from different regions were also paid a part of the Mughal court. For example, the Rajput rulers. A number of Rajput rulers became a part of the Mughal court itself. So the Hindustani faction had Indian Muslim elites, had uh, also a number of local level rulers of different regions. For example, like the Rajputs. It's also a fact that we often talk about that how Shivaji was, you know, was the one individual who held the fort against Aurangzeb. But even Aurang when Aurangzeb had defeated, this is just for your understanding, even when Aurangzeb had defeated Shivaji, he offered Shivaji also a position within his own army, making him an a general within his own army and Shivaji also accepted that position. But then later things turned out to be ugly between them and eventually Shivaji said that no, I will not serve in this position any further. So we'll talk about that later. But what you basically I'm trying to say is that there were different sections of the nobility. Just like for example, you have North India, South India, Rati, Turani, Irani and Hindustani. There were different sections within the Mughal nobility and they were often in conflict with each other. But then why are they often in conflict with each other? This is related to the economics of the issue. Because politics can never happen without economics. So, this political disputes that were there between the Turani and the Irani and the Hindustani faction are basically related to the economics of the Mughal Empire that we have to understand. Once we understand, then we'll put everything together. But, for example, a leader of the main leader of the Turani faction were the Sayyid brothers. These were the individuals who had got the who had got Farooq Siyar on the throne. Okay, but Irani faction, for example, was led by Asaf Jahan one. Asaf Jahan one was basically the one who brought the Irani and the Hindustani faction and organized an assassination of the Sayyid brothers. So you see that there were competing alliances that were being formed between the different sections of the Mughal nobility to try and outsmart the other. So what do you see? That there are already a political succession dispute going on. On top of that, there is so much factionalism within the Mughal court. So these are political reasons. So. Uh, but then we need to understand why this factionalism is happening within the Mughal court. We'll come to that. But before that, we let's just put the political reasons together. Now, when we talk about the political reasons, <coughs> the first thing is succession disputes. After the death of Aurangzeb, now I'm not writing whole sentences. I really write whole sentences. So you keep following what I'm saying and what I'm writing together. So succession disputes after the death of Aurangzeb in 1707. Saw political instability creeping saw so political instability creeping in the Mughal Empire saw so political instability creeping in the Mughal Empire that's reason A okay the reason B is Apart from succession disputes, the reason B is factionalism within the Mughal court. 
factionalism within the Mughal courts, for example, between the Turani faction and the Irani and Hindustani faction. Right? So these are the reason, the factionalism within the Mughal court, for example, between the Turani and Irani and Hindustani faction. Now, I'm not elaborating on these points, but I'm just giving you the pointers. Details you'll find in the PPT and we'll go through that. Okay, so these are the two major political reasons. But I told you that this factionalism within the Mughal court, this fighting between the different sections of the Mughal nobility is happening because of the economics. So what is the economics? The economics is something which is related to the structure of the Mughal administration also. So what is the structure of the Mughal administration that we need to know? <coughs> now, you will see that If you see the structure of the Mughal administration, there would be a king. Okay. And below the king, there would be the members of the nobility. Right? But then amongst these nobility, from the members of the Irani, the Turani, and the Hindustani faction, what you would see was would be that a number of members from this nobility would actually be appointed as what are known as Jagirdars or Mansabdars. Okay. Now, for example, you talk about Zamindars, right? So they are like cousins of Jagirdars and the Mansabdars in a way. That Jagirdars and Mansabdars would be appointed from the Irani, the Hindustani, and the Turani faction by the king. The king would decide who would become a Jagirdar, who would get a bigger Jagirdari, who would get a smaller Jagirdari. So basically, the king would, the king's position was important because he would decide. He was the only and the final authority. There were no rules, nothing. Only the king would decide uh, who would go on to become uh, the next Jagirdar in a particular area. Now, when you see, so for example, what was the role of this Jagirdar is important. What will happen is that one Jagirdar would be given one particular Territory. Now, one Jagirdar would be given one particular territory. And say, basically, if the king had the whole of India under control, he would have a number of Jagirdars for different territorial regions. But what was the responsibility of these Jagirdars? The responsibility of these Jagirdars was like IPS and IRS fused together. Okay. In the sense, the, require, the, uh, the responsibility of these Jagirdars was firstly to maintain the army or maintain a section of the army in a state of military preparedness and the second responsibility was tax collection okay so basically what was the structure see the how is the mughal army and mughal economy organized is what is important because this will tell you about the weaknesses in their economy as well as the weaknesses in their army the structure was this, that the king would appoint a Jagirdar, I am not saying Zamindar, I am saying Jagirdar for a reason. A Jagirdar or a Mansardar, that's what the name was. So a Jagirdar or Mansardar would be appointed for a specific territorial uh, limit by the king directly. They would report only to the king. Their responsibility was to collect revenue from these areas, okay. Also obviously by taxing agriculture. And a portion of this tax they would keep with themselves. This portion of the tax that they would keep with themselves would be used to do two things. Firstly, live a lavish life. Obviously, that's what life is for. Secondly, is to maintain the army. Basically, a part portion of the revenue thus would be used for maintaining. The king would give a target to this particular Jagirdar or Zamindar, uh, Jagirdar or Mansardar, that you have to maintain 500 soldiers and to 20 horses. So, 500 soldiers and 20 horses have to be maintained, prepared for any eventuality all the time. Whatever are the expenses for maintaining the army would be borne by the Jagirdar. Okay. Because in return, they are getting the revenue collecting rights for the whole 
region. So on the one side they were given revenue collecting rights, on the other side they were given the responsibility to maintain the army in a state of preparedness. But that is to be done say from say from a part of the total revenue. So hypothetically one could say that two thirds of the total revenue Hypothetically, I am saying it varied from region to region. Two thirds of the total revenue, the Jagirdar would keep with themselves to perform the responsibility. One third of the revenue would go to the Mughal coffers. Okay. So, in the sense that this was the way a revenue distribution scheme was there between the Jagirdar and the Emperor, the Jagirdar also had a responsibility to maintain the army. So that is what was there. Now come to think of it, does the Indian army today have the responsibility to collect taxes? Does army in most of the countries has the responsibility to collect taxes? No. Why? Because of two reasons. The first reason is that it will divert the energies away from their core task. That is to maintain armed preparedness. Secondly, you will make an intermediary within the power structure so powerful that if they revolt against the king, the king, if unless is a strong emperor, will find it difficult to subdue the intermediary. That is why it's said very commonly, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay. So in that sense, the understanding was that what was happening here was the intermediaries themselves were powerful. And in the absence of a strong king, it was relatively different to, difficult to control them. Okay, that was one of the reasons. The other reason was that there was a conflict within the Mughal nobility and the different factions within the Mughal court because every faction wanted more Jagirdaris, bigger Jagirdaris, more fertile Jagirdaris to be given to members from their group. So the Iranis wanted that more Jagirs should go to them. The bigger Jagirs should go to them. Not all Jagirs were of equal sizes as well. So there was always a competition to get hold of these Jagirs. And this is what later led to what is called as the Jagirdari crisis. This Jagirdari crisis was happening because of two reasons. Okay, don't worry, I'll write that down. The Jagirdari crisis were happening because of two reasons. On the one side, the crisis was happening because there were too many Jagirdars and there were relatively few Jagirs. Okay, in the sense, that you have or आप सब में ही कंपटीशन है यूपीएससी की सीट के लिए यूपीएससी क्राइसिस कह लीजिए दैट देयर टू मेनी कंपटीटर्स एंड देयर फ्यू फ्यू सीट्स इन द सेंस दैट देयर वर टू मेनी पीपल ऑफ द मुगल नोबिलिटी हु वर चेजिंग टू फ्यू जागीर्स देन द वे फॉरवर्ड वाज टू इंक्रीज द नंबर ऑफ जागीर्स or decrease the number of members of the Nubal nobility. Now decreasing the number of members could not happen. The only possible way was to increase the number of jagirs. That is why Aurangzeb was also looking to expand into newer areas. Apart from the economics also is to ensure that there are enough number of jagirs so that there is not too much factionalism within the court. There is enough to satisfy members of the ruling elite. So that happens and he expands into the Deccan. But again, while expanding into the Deccan, he would also incorporate more new members of the local ruling elite. So the size of the Jagir, the size of those who were seeking the Jagirdari would also keep on increasing even when new areas were brought under the control. So the competition did not subside substantially. Once he died, the competition became even more fierce. Also, there was another reason that Aurangzeb, while he was expanding into the Deccan, he also devised this. I am telling you, this is not in the PPT, you don't need to write. But just for your understanding, because this is all questions that kids ask me about this. I will tell you before. There is another reason, what, there is another thing that Aurangzeb did. And that was something that was called as the Khalisa land. One of the ways in which he was correcting revenue was through the Jagirdars. There was another way in which he was collecting revenue and that was that he would collect revenue directly from some areas. For example, there would be an area in between from where he would collect revenue directly through his own revenue officials, not giving anything to the Jagirdas. He would appoint some salaried officials who would collect revenue from these areas. This was called as the royal land or the Khalisa land. Okay, from these areas, Mughals would collect or the central ruler would collect the revenue directly because this would ensure that there is no intermediary in between and they get a major share of the revenue. So to that extent, 
that is also something that was happening parallelly so even bringing areas under the khalisa land meant that the jagirdari crisis could not be addressed you know and in deccan when he expanded he did bring a good amount of area under the khalisa control as well because it would directly boost the state's revenues but also it did nothing to basically it did, it did not address the problem of the jagirdari crisis so in one line if one was to say what was the jagirdari crisis shekhar bandopadhyay says that it was basically a problem of too many jagirdars chasing too few jagirs okay that is what was fueling the political conflict between within the mughals court okay so that's something about the jagirdari crisis but what but what is the jagirdari system the jagirdari system basically is fusing military responsibilities with the revenue collecting responsibilities into one authority a jagirdar was appointed directly by the mughal emperor and basically he did not have any rights over this land everything belonged to the king no jagirdar had any right that oh this land belongs to me they only had revenue collecting rights even this jagirdari was not hereditary to ensure that these people do not become too powerful if they continue to control the same area they would become they would develop local loyalties and they would become more powerful so to ensure this what the emperor would do from time to time was transfer a jagirdar from one area to another so frequent transfers were often done so as to ensure that the jagirdar does not develop local loyalty and challenge the king himself that's the reason why civil servants are also frequently transferred history that's why i say is not history it it you'll find there is application in the present as well so that's so this jagirdari was not hereditary that's what i'm trying to point out but zamindari when you talk about and zamindari system that the british what was hereditary that is why you say hum to zamindari rehne se hai okay so that's the difference in many of the books that you read for example if you go to spectrum you will see that they use the word jagirdari and zamindari interchangeably but that is not exactly the case that's not factually true but people simplify and so if you reading somewhere in mughal era jagirdari or zamindari both the terms are being used no need to get confused okay so but technically jagirdari was not hereditary while zamindari was hereditary okay so that's there okay and so this is so how is it related to the economic crisis and how because is the fact that once the mughal rule centralized mughal rule ended there was competition between the jagirdars but also something was happening again because they knew now there is no longer a central mughal to discipline them what it resulted was a corruption within the within the army in the sense that they now knew that there was not a very strong central ruler to discipline them so if they had a responsibility to maintain 500 soldiers they would maintain 200 who's going to transfer them who's going to discipline them okay so there was military unpreparedness also happening because of this jagirdari crisis that was so this jagirdari crisis was basically leading to corruption within the army and this corruption within the army was fueling military unpreparedness as well okay so you see because they were not firstly you know so they would often basically bypass or would you know even if they had a particular target they would not maintain the adequate number of forces so even the problems within the economy affected the military preparedness of the mughals okay that's there now we'll so you have economic problems they are leading to agricultural problems now you could ask you could have asked you can ask me one question here is that okay they are collecting at they are collecting taxes from taxing agriculture they could raise if they were not getting new areas under their control they could raise the tax rates or if but the problem with raising the tax rates was that it would lead to peasant revolts peasants would not simply just sit back and just keep paying whatever taxes that the zamindar that the jagirdar would demand the peasant revolts also happened because of any further increase in tax rates the other possibility was also there without increasing tax rates taxes could more taxes could be collected if if you could increase agricultural productivity so 
if for example say this was a region where you earlier paid 30% of the tax of the total produce as a tax if say hypothetically 300 crores was being produced then 30% of 300 crores would be what how much maths people 90 crores right so 90 crores would be the tax but if one was to increase the tax collection without bringing new areas into control or without increasing the tax rate a better way also was to increase the productivity of this land fertility of this land and if say the fertility of the land increased and the production now became 1000 crores or the production doubled only or tripled if say it became 1000 crores and you still collecting only 30% tax then you have 300 crores. So the only way forward to increase tax collection was not just to increase agricultural rates or to bring in more areas under control but the third possibility was also there and that was to increase agricultural productivity. So this third route was also there but neither the Mughals nor the Marathas nor Hyderabad except Mysore in 18th and 19th century India no kingdom or no princely state actually improved the productivity of agriculture. In post-independent India, the Green Revolution was the period where you saw the increase in productivity of agriculture. Nor did the British increase the productivity of agriculture. So nobody was taking any keen interest in increasing the productivity of agriculture. And because of this, for increasing revenue base, the only way left forward was further expansion. That is what explains why in 19th century India and throughout the world, empires were seeking to expand. Always constant expansion. Do you see constant expansion today? China has become a 12 trillion dollar economy, second only to the United States. Has it done military expansion? No. In terms of direct military expansion, it has not resorted to any of that. Right? And how has that happened? Without by increasing the productivity of their economy. So you see, this is something that Mughal India was not doing. It was not increasing the productivity of the economy because investing in agri increasing the productivity of agriculture would rely on bringing new technologies in agriculture, on bringing more land under irrigation. If one has to increase productivity, Tabi, if you are just dependent on the rains, there would be either floods or droughts and that would compromise the productivity. So if you had to increase productivity, you had to invest in infrastructure to increase productivity but investing in agriculture would mean spending state revenue which would in the long term increase productivity but that is something that was not the priority of the state the state did not want to spend to increase productivity it wanted the productivity to either increase magically or something should happen to increase revenue collection without increasing the spending and to that extent the Mughals did not spend to increase productivity of agriculture that was also a reason for its economic weaknesses they are spending more to fight wars they are not spending to increase productivity of the land that is already under their control so fighting wars firstly one should understand is an expensive affair secondly it is not just expensive to fight wars one of the it also a, a better way to strengthen one's economy is not by engaging in war but by increasing in increasing productivity of their economy. This the Mughals did not do. So you see the Jagiridari crisis is an economic problem. It is related to corruption within the army and is hampering the functioning of the army also. They are not increasing the productivity of agriculture also. Another problem that was there within the army was that in the army they introduced no new technological innovations from the 1700s. They, in 1700 also they were fighting with the same technology that they were fighting in 1750s. For 50 or in fact for 70 years they introduced no new technology in the army and by this time you see the western world there are a series of developments in the technological sphere. For example the coming of the Enfield rifle starts by 1750s for the Britishers for the first time. So you see there are no new technological innovations which are happening even within the army. So even that is hampering the functioning of the army. Okay. So I've talked to you in brief about the causes of the economy, also how it related to the problems of the army. So political economic army, 
The last major category that we firstly need to talk about is the socio-religious. That is why Aurangzeb Road became APJ Abdul Kalam Road. That Aurangzeb's religious policies were have said to be have basically alienated a number of the subject population which was predominantly Hindu. Foremost amongst them for which Aurangzeb is remembered more than anything else is the imposition of Jazia or a religious tax upon non-believers or non-Muslims, put it in a way. So it is often said that this policy of Aurangzeb alienated or basically led to dissatisfaction amongst the Hindu sections of the population. So, so the peasantry already was dealing with high taxations. On top of that, if you have another tax which is also imposed on a religious uh, you know, basis is something that also led to some amount of dissatisfaction against Aurangzeb. Beyond that, we are not going to discuss too much about Jazia. Jazia itself can be discussed for a whole lecture. But we are not going to discuss that or anything beyond that. That's important. Uh, that, that much is important for us. One thing also why I am saying we are not going to discuss that is political controversies are something that is useless for UPSC. They don't ask something like that directly. For example, even you know, these there is some kind of a counterfactual thinking. Agar ye nahi hota, to kya hota? Or would have, what would have happened if one particular individual would not have been there? So, or you know, what was happening in Nehru's personal life is not of interest to polit to our historical understanding. So, cheesy things about people in their personal life is not something that we cover in the class. Also, not outside the class. But if you have more curiosities on political issues and also that we can discuss after the class. But anything on the personal side is not there. So let's now, any doubts still here, firstly to understand, we'll then put the points. Any doubts still here? Yeah. Yeah, tell me. Sir, I understand the rules that uh, what uh, Zagizar and... Uh and all these but what was the main role in the court that Hindu, Hinduism and that Iraqi and Turkey were playing with the... See, okay, so what he's saying, what he's asking is that he understands that this, this division between Jagirdari and the Khalisa land. But what is the, what, what is the main game that, they are, that the sections of the Mughal nobility, the Irani, Turani, Hindustani are playing in the Mughal court? The main game that they're playing is that they want that the king should be one which is closer to their faction so that the king grants maximum number of jagirs, jagirs to the nobles from their faction. So this is the reason why the Sayyid brothers got Farooq Sihar appointed. Uh, the Sayyid brothers got the Farooq Sihar assassinated because Farooq Sihar was not perceived as closer to the Turani faction. Okay. But later, when Muhammad Shah was installed on the throne, you see the Nizamul Mulk, Asaf Jahan he takes a stand that rather than tackling you know, uh, the king himself, what is more important to tackle is to remove the influence in the king. And that is of the Sayyid brothers. So he gets the Sayyid brothers assassinated. So these assassinations and counter assassinations and replacements that are happening are backed by one faction or the other within the Mughal court essentially because they want a ruler closer to them to become the Mughal emperor so that they get the majority of the Jagis. That means as executive role they are playing nothing. As an executive role? As a duty or the, as these Jagidars are paying uh, that taxes and all these things. Means they are performing some sort of work. Yeah. But on the other hand, these guys, these three communities are not uh, doing any professional or any duty there in the court. See, okay, see one thing, that, uh, what he is asking is that on the one side they are collecting revenue and all, but they are not doing any particular duty in the court. See, that the whole role of the nobility was, the whole priorities of the nobility was firstly in getting the jagis. They would have some role in, you know, law making also, deciding the rates of the taxes etc also. But beyond that, the main core role was to get appointed as jagirdars. And also, one thing also that one should, you know, I understand what this is coming from. This is coming from, because you often try to see, compare what is happening today, you know, that how was the structure actually working? You know, for example, you have a president, you have a prime minister, then you have a cabinet minister, and then you have chief minister, and then you have administrative officers under them. Firstly, it was not a very system, the Mughal architecture, or in fact, 18th century rulers were not very systematically or 
uh, organized as compared to the trade in the sense that they did not have a very clear distribution of power okay and it was not something that was constitutionally mandated everything belonged to the king all the authority rested in the king the king would appoint anybody to perform a particular set of duty he would appoint a wazir under him who would be his deputy who would be responsible for the day to day affairs etc we don't get into the details of these structures because again this is not directly you know relevant to us but yes what is relevant is why these disputes were happening and that was predominant to get a control of the jagirs and Anyth anything else Okay, you need to start opening up over a period of time. You'll take a, probably a class or two. But by then you should start voicing, Sir, slow or high, sir, tez or high. The more you open up, the better it is. As far as the pace, you think it's slow? How many think it's slow? Nobody thinks it's slow. Only two people. Only two people think it's slow. Okay, the rest, there are some who think it's slow, but they feel it's beyond their dignity to raise their hand. I empathize. Uh, how many think it's fast? Okay, a few think it fast. How many think it's fine? Okay, the majority thinks it's fine. Okay, so people who feel it's slow, reality check, I can't go slower than this. It will get faster than this, but for the first three lectures, we're going to stick to this. So don't worry also at times that if you're not, you know, you feel that you've not consolidated everything, go back and read the PPT, you will consolidate everything. Yeah. Socio-religious aspect. So what she's asking is the social-religious aspect. See, the social-religious aspect is one simple thing. One of the reasons that historians attribute that there was local resistance to Mughal rule. And to clarify, let me clarify. It was not that from the time of Akbar or Babur they were imposing Jazia. Okay? It was only Aurangzeb and some rulers even before him for, who for certain period of times imposed Jazia. Aurangzeb also for his whole period of rule did not impose Jazia. It was only from the 1680s later to 1700 for the last 20 years of his rule he imposed Jazia. Okay? But we often attribute something uh, to his imposition of this religious tax. Basically if you were a non-Muslim under Aurangzeb's rule, you had to pay a particular amount of additional tax. Because the other side, I'm not telling you because we don't need it. But nonetheless, uh, that was also because Aurangzeb had also made a rule that if you had to serve in the army as a soldier, you had to be a believer according to him. And because you were not a believer according to him, you were being granted a freedom not to serve in the army. So the tax was basically a compensation for not serving in the army. But we are not getting into these details, okay? Ki jazia ka assessment, nobody is going to ask you. That was Jazia a good thing, bad thing, how, to what extent it played a role in the decline of the Mughal Empire. They are not going to ask you any of this. What you need to know basically that was an imposition of a religious tax, which basically was something that generated disaffection amongst the Hindu subject population against the Mughal rule or this generated disaffection amongst the masses against the Mughal rule. Also, uh, so let's first complete the chart and then I'll also dictate one or two questions to you. Any other problems still here? Anything else? Yeah. So whatever you're seeing, is it written in the PPT? Yeah, yeah. I'll walk you through the PPT. First PPT, this is only demo. First PPT, I'll take you every word through in the PPT. But then it becomes a template. Okay. So we'll do that. Once we'll draw the flow chart, then we'll walk through the PPT. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Till here? Fine. Okay. So, see, I... Yeah, what happened? Okay, there you see. People must be empowered. You can all ask for the remote from each other or probably they have multiple remotes here. Okay, so probably even before the class you were just sitting under the AC, you want to change the temperature, etc. You can do that. Now, apart from that, so let's see for the reasons for the decline of the Mughal Empire, there are the political causes, right? Apart from the political causes, as I told you, that there are causes related to the economic structure. Now, when we talk about the causes related to the economic structure, and please talk, reach a consensus after a point between yourselves, and don't keep doing this all the time also, okay? So, uh, in the sense, that when we talk about the economic structure and the problems within the economic structure, we say that the Jagirdari crisis 
was one of the major reasons for the problems within the economic structure that basically the javedari crisis involved too many jagirdars chasing too few jagirs this is and this jagirdari crisis is what fueled already something that have we've talked about factionalism within the mughal mughal court that this fueled this jagirdari crisis is what is what fueled the factionalism within the mughal court jagirdari crisis basically meant too many jagirdars chasing too few jagirs it fueled factionalism within the mughal court you should learn to understand the sign language okay bahut sari language hum sikhenge so you should learn to understand the sign language it, it, it fueled factionalism within the mughal court but jagirdari crisis was one thing everybody is written this much i'll rub it so that i can write up so that people who are sitting at the back can see clearly now when we talk so on the one side we talk about the jagirdari crisis as an economic cause the other major economic cause that we talk about is the inability of the mughals to increase sign language to increase agricultural productivity to increase agricultural productivity they failed to do so and this is also something that is weakening the economic aspect another reason in the economics is also something the vastly expensive deccan wars that aurangzeb fought the vastly expensive deccan war that the Aur- that aurangzeb fought weakened the mughals financially okay teen char reasons i can add more but i'm limiting myself to this much okay okay मेरे को पता था ये होता ही है मैं कितनी भी बार बोलूँ बच्चे हमेशा पूछते हैं कि जागीरदारी और जमींदारी में क्या डिफरेंस है आई एम टेलिंग अगेन लिख लीजिए जागीरदारी इज हेरिट इज नॉट हेरिडिट्री जमींदारी इज हेरिडिट्री मुगल स्ट्रक्चर में द मेन मोड ऑफ रेवेन्यू कलेक्शन वॉज नॉट जमींदारी it was jagirdari in british rule it was zamindari iska matlab to aur main fir bol raha hu you find in spectrum or maybe in some other sources also they use these terms interchangeably okay but that is not ideally how it's supposed to be but nothing is ideal so jagirdari and zamindari often are used interchangeably though it should not be done so again there were some zamindars also in the mughal era but the predominant mode of organization was actually the jagirdari system okay so just stick to this okay we'll see that the british bring in the idea of right to property for the first time that is when land becomes a commodity that one could inherit before that there was no real estate okay so in that context you see i hope that's clear now now Uh, so the jagirdari crisis were there the expensive wars of the deccan was there the inability of the mughal to increase agricultural productivity all of these are reasons for the economic decline of the mughals but apart from that also is the structure of the army right i told you right that the jagirdari system is also the way to organize the army but corruption within 
द आर्मी करप्शन विद इन द आर्मी वॉज अ रिजल्ट वॉज समथिंग दैट वी किड द आर्मी एंड दिस वॉज ड्यू टू द जागीरदारी crisis and the absence of a strong ruler who could discipline absence and due to the absence of a uh, the and due to the absence of a strong ruler who could discipline the jagir dars it's also called as i told you before mansab dars or mansab dari mansab dars okay so basically there was corruption within the army that's was that is the reason one of the reasons for military un- under preparedness and basically another reason for military under preparedness is the absence of new technological innovations within the absence of new technological innovations within the army so that's the causes related to the army we already discussed that right last thing is about the socio religious is mein bas ek line likhenge the imposition of the the spelling may vary from book to book somewhere it's written as jazia other is the spelling with the z it's, so uh, basically somewhere it started as j somewhere it started as z okay now uh, basically the imposition of jazia or a religious tax on non muslims alienated alienated or alienated ka synonym mai ko nahi pata alienated basically alien dur ajnabi bana dena dur kar dena or sow the seeds of disaffection let's put it that way alienated the uh, on non muslims alienated the subject class under mughal rule so 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 that's what i'm saying that the socio religious club basically involved in position of jazia by aurangzeb uh, or a religious tax on non muslims which alienated the subject class under the mughal rule okay now these are the major categories right economic political causes related to the army and the socio religious structures any doubts still have fine okay let's go through the ppt so that you get a hang of uh, how it's supposed to happen dekhe as i have already told you whatever is there not in blue or in red is just to give you a feel and to give you a context of what was happening so you will see that there was aurangzeb then there was bahadur shah then there was jahandar shah then there was farooq siyar all of these details you know why finances was weakening slowly slowly etc i've explained you everything i'm not going to sit here for you to read this this is just a timeline whatever is the timeline timelines are never and i'll draw till now i have not drawn timelines but i'll draw many timelines in the class on the board you just stick to those timelines these timelines are relatively more in detail but just in case you want to find out who was whose brother cousin sister etc that is there here okay but beyond that oh, you obviously don't need to remember it so all of this is basically a detail of you know who was there now we'll talk about some of the points about nadir shah and all these things later but it's put in here itself now we'll cause see the causes of the decline of the mughal empire now basically see and there's also one thing that before i get into any further ye mujhe yaad aa gaya abhi isse pehle ki aap mujhse puchte answer right देखिए जब व्हेन वी आर न्यू टू प्रिपरेशन वी आर वेरी योर 
Uh, what, we are very enthusiastic. Enthusiasm no, no, knows no bound. And the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is, Sir, now the answer writing is not happening. See, firstly, I'll talk about answer writing after the first three classes. Okay. Then we'll talk a bit about answer writing. So don't think about answer writing for now. And secondly, you'll not be in a position to write answers for a good period of time. Okay. Why? Because answer writing basically requires you not just to understand the thing, but also remember those points. And that will happen only when you have read something twice or thrice at least. Okay. And in the meanwhile, you'll definitely get some answer writing assignments from here. Right. You keep trying and writing those answers. You keep trying and you keep writing those answers. Your mistakes etc. would be pointed out. But there's no need to get too emotional that, oh, I'm not able to express myself. That you're not able to express yourself. Okay. A, a lot of people who may not be from the English background, often, I tell you, this, these are things that comes to people's mind. Okay, I'm not from the social sciences. I don't have good expression skills. A lot of people think so. Some may think that I'm not very proficient in English. I'm not very fluent in English, so my writing is suffering. <laughs> Both the assumptions that you are not from social sciences and so you cannot express yourself very well is an assumption that people who are in social sciences express themselves well. That is not true. Okay. And the second thing is expression here does not mean that you have to write in a very flowery language English has to be crisp and precise. No, you have to get the point across is the main concern. Okay. And A ka an ho jayega, koi dikkar nahi hai. Ek the extra aagya answer mein, no problems at all. In fact, contrary, I would have seen is people who are more fluent and who are more used to writing big answers and big essays on any topic that you give them. Okay. Jaise ye hota hai na, engineering mein bhi, medical mein bhi, ki paper bharna hai. Question ka answer, diagram, char chipkao. You have to do that. You have to put in a few diagrams, put some data and write big, right? That is not the requirement of UPSC. Write small is the requirement of UPSC, okay? We'll come to all of that. So don't think that because you're not fluent in English, you will to miss out on something. Contrary, I've seen people who are not fluent in English are very economical with words, okay? Because they're trying to think and then write. Their plan doesn't just go like a you know, like that. And so they are relatively, they get better marks in the mains examination because they are writing concise. Unki ma, unki kahani nahi chalo ho rahe, introduction se jase yaha hai. This is kahani. That Aurangzeb was there from 1658 to 1700 and seven, he was a strong ruler, etc. But the decline began after the death of Aurangzeb. A person who does not, who is not that proficient or who is, no, who is known to write to the point will say, the causes for the decline of the Mughal Empire are 1, 2, 3, 4. He will not give you some amazing insights into the introduction or anything. So don't think too much about answer writing for now. And also realize that what I put in red and blue is what basically is summing up everything in one line. So Aurangzeb's expansionist military cam campaigns in the Deccan, especially in the regions of Bijapur and Golconda, which were basically in the Deccan region, were the wars that he fought, which were usually expensive wars and basically financially weakened the Mughal Empire. That's one of the major causes. Another cause also, now this is not exactly in the same order I've discussed in the class, but everything is there. Another major cause is this cause of his religious policies, such as the imposition of Jazia, which alienated the Hindus who constituted the majority of his subject population. Okay, that's another point. The third point is about the Jagirdari crisis that we've already talked about. That you will see that is me kuch aur chide mi hai. Dekhe kya hai? What this period, this portion has been taken and put in a point wise format from Shekhar Vandapath hai. He has this habit of writing things in a complex manner. So he says that the Mughal Empire is a war state. A state which is con continuously seeking to fight wars and expand further. Because expansion becomes the mode of revenue generation. Okay, so that is why he says that it's a war state. And basically, then this is just a feeler of you know how everything was organized around the king. Now, what was Mansabdari is something that I've explained in between. I've already told it to you. And basically, this is an explanation of how the Mansabdar was given the authority to collect land revenue, and in exchange, they had to maintain number of soldiers. Most of these jagirs were transferable. That is something that you need to know. Now, 
एंड आई एम सेइंग मोस्ट आई एम नॉट सेइंग ऑल बट हमारे लिए मोस्ट बहुत है ओके नाउ आल्सो दिस मंसरदारी सिस्टम अनदर कैरेक्टरिस्टिक ऑफ दिस मंसरदारी सिस्टम वाज समथिंग दैट इट वाज बेस्ड ऑन अ पैटर्न क्लाइंट रिलेशनशिप वी यूज दिस टर्म पैटर्न क्लाइंट टू एम्फसाइज द फैक्ट दैट द पैटर्न इज द किंग इट इज द किंग हु डिसाइड्स हु गेट्स अ मंसरदारी व्हाट इज द साइज द मंसरदार्स हैव नो राइट अगेंस्ट द किंग दे आर हिज सर्वेंट्स दैट्स द पैटर्न इज द किंग क्लाइंट इज अ mansardar that's called a patron client relationship so in in that sense you know that's something that was a another thing and also i told you one of the thing that there were no more conquests since the time of aurangzeb you already have a jagirdari crisis you cannot expand any further from the time of aurangzeb there were no further military expansions and this meant that the jagirdari crisis was becoming even more acute right so that's also something that was there now finally coming back to that same jagirdari crisis point this is what i told you right this is the line that i wrote that too many jagirdars chasing too few chagis coupled with the highly you can add this as well coupled with the highly unequal size of the jagis the competition was also to get the bigger jagis because all jagis were neither equal in size nor in the terms of the revenue that they could provide this led to intense conflicts within the mughal nobility between the turani faction and the turani and the irani and the hindustani factions okay so that's there we've already talked about it we've talked about the weakening of the military might the weakening of the military might was happening because the dissatisfied nobles did not maintain the required number of soldiers and horses and there was no effective supervision either what's called as corruption within the army now also there were no fresh technological inputs within the army that's also something that has been done and also there were recurrent peasant revolts now this i didn't put it here in the points but it's something that i told you right that any attempt to increase taxes beyond a particular limit would lead to peasant revolts and a number of and what would also happen was that a number of jagirdars and mansardars who did not get you know or who did not get jagirs or who were thrown out of the system they would often try to give leadership to these revolts to extract a bargain from the king so you used to see that that is also another important reason that one could see also now this is uh, this is shekhar bandopadhyay's conclusion but this is just for your reading कहीं नहीं लिखना है आपको बट जस्ट टू गेट अस वट ही शेखर बंदोपाध्यायरी इंडिया इज नॉट अ पीरियड ऑफ डार्क एज दैट देर वॉज नो रूलर इन इंडिया आफ्टर द मुगल एम्पायर डिक्लाइन देर वर अ नंबर ऑफ सक्सेस स्टेट्स विच वर कमिंग अप दैट वील टॉक अबाउट एंड दिस इज द चैप्टर समरी ऑल्सो दैट एव पुट इन फॉर यू ऑलमोस्ट एट द एंड ऑफ एवरी चैप्टर ओके बेसिकली विच कंबाइंस ऑल द कॉजेज टूगेदर सो दिस इज देखिए क्या होता है ना कि खाना हैज बीन प्रोसेस्ड इट हैज बीन द फूड हैज बीन प्रोसेस्ड इट हैज बीन पुट ऑन योर टेबल एंड यू हैव टू ईट बिकॉज वी लिव इन द फास्ट फूड जेनरेशन वेयर फूड हैज टू बी प्रोसेस्ड एंड पुट आई टेल यू आई आई यूज टू डू दिस यू नो आई यूज टू टेल स्टूडेंट्स दैट आफ्टर यू डन एवरी चैप्टर यू शुड मेक अ फ्लो चार्ट काइंड ऑफ अ समरी ऑन योर ओन बट दैट इज एक्सपेक्टिंग टू मच राइट from people and from ourselves so i realized they don't do it so then i did it so now i have done this okay but then again the problem with doing this is this can never replace your own summary okay so probably what you can do is because i have just summarized everything in one one line but if you want to add a few more points you add it here why i am doing so and the reason why i'm going to do so is suppose you have 35 topics in modern indian history you should have 35 small summaries like this because that is what you will revise long long after you have left the coaching one day before your mains examination where you have to revise both history geography social issues for paper 1 and paper 2 also you have polity and international relations one day before the examination so that will happen only when you start doing this kind of an activity for all your subjects from now on it's it lekin zyada over burden karne ki zarurat nahi hai you can start this a week later or two weeks later okay so that you get a, a sense of what you are supposed to do on your own okay now so the decline of the mughals thus is over still here you can write down a few uh, a question
the reasons for the decline of the Mughal Empire were inherent. The reasons for the decline of the Mughal Empire were inherent were inherent inherent in their administrative structure itself it were inherent in their administrative structure itself discuss all right now obviously this is a simple question because it's a first class okay questions will get more complex as we move into the classes okay. and we'll see later also a comparison of the mughal administrative structure with that of the marathas with that of mysore okay so we'll also do that over a period of time but i'm just pointing it out to here this much is clear now the next thing that we'll talk about and there's a separate ppt for that and that is basically about the re uh, that i say that the decline of the mughal empire begins with the death of aurangzeb but it becomes conclusive with the battle of plassey and the battle of baksa but to understand the battle of plassey and the battle of baksa what we need to understand is something else before firstly we need to know that after 1719 specifically you know when mohammad shah you you don't need to remember the name aapko thoda thoda familiar ho hi jayega vaise but mohammad shah came to power as i am telling you from 1720 to 1748 during the time of mohammad shah itself it is becoming clear that even when there is relative stability coming back for the next 28 years under mohammad shah's rule what is becoming clear that the erstwhile nobles and the strong nobles within aurangzeb's court have started parting ways with the central mughal ruler and this is where you see the start of the formation of successor states of the mughal empire successor states the mughal empire were established by princely princely states or princely rulers and who were these princely states and princely rulers that is something that is important to understand what you will find is for example within the mughal court i told you nizam ul mulk was there he assassinated the sayyid brothers and he got himself assassinated uh, um, uh, appointed as the wazir okay he got it got himself appointed as the wazir our wazir would be the deputy in the court and this was in 1722 but in 1724 he realizes that rather than continuing as a wazir in the central mughal court i should become the governor of one of the different regions within the central mughal rule dekhiye pehli baat wahan ka governor aur abhi ka governor ka koi correlation nahi hai theek hai so governor then was very different from governor today basically what would happen would be that one thing to understand is before we get into this any further is that what would happen would be that under the the king i told you right that there is a mansabdari system etc but the king also would appoint governors to different regions who would oversee the working of different regions the administration also apart from revenue collection etc also so he would be the eyes of the king in different region okay so big was the king cannot directly oversee everything right he would also have his own appointees who would through whom he would be informed of the situations of the different regions so the governor was almost the eyes of the king in a region and so nizam ul mulk said that rather than becoming the wazir here it would be better that i would basically become the governor of one of the regions and this is for example what he decides for himself in case of hyderabad so he basically uh, gets the erstwhile governor of hyderabad removed and gets himself appointed as the uh, 
governor of Hyderabad. And over a period of time, slowly, he becomes more and more autonomous. He takes more and more control of the region within, under bringing it, uh, or he takes more and more control of the region himself. And basically, he continues the relation with the Mughal ruler, but not in a very substantive way, in the sense that the day-to-day -day decisions he would make on his own and slowly and slowly started becoming autonomous. It's a slow process, doesn't start off all of a sudden. Because Nizam al-Mulk was an important noble in the time of Aurangzeb also. Okay? And so he was definitely way more elder and, way, and understood the administration much better than the new Mughal king himself. Okay? Similarly was the case in Bengal. Bengal then on the Hyderabad province, in the Hyderabad province was Nizam al-Mulk. In the Bengal province was firstly Murshid Kuli and then they later Alivardi Khan. Okay, so we'll talk about that Murshid Kuli was another, he was the governor here and he also started becoming autonomous. Why? Because they knew that there was no longer a central ruler and one sooner or later it's possible that the central Mughal rule will come to end. End. So, what do we call as Mughal successor states? The three major Mughal successor states that we call. There were other smaller ones also, but the three major ones one was Hyderabad, other was Bengal, and the third was Awadh or the state of UP. So, what you will see later that these are successor Mughal states because they were erstwhile members of the Mughal court themselves. And the first state that we will talk about is Bengal. When we talk about Bengal, that is when we talk about the Battle of Plassey and Battle of Baksa. There is a separate PPT for that. Okay. Now, when we talk about Bengal, thus, what needs to be understood is Bengal was a very different state. Bengal firstly then was Bengal, Bihar and Odisha together today. All that was Bengal province. Okay. And Bengal not just was a large province but was also a wealthy province. In fact, one third of the total Mughal revenue came from the state of Bengal. Why? Why so much revenue is coming from Bengal? Firstly, because it is in the plain of Ganga, right? So it is agriculturally fertile land. Secondly, so agriculturally it was prosperous. Secondly, trade was also something that was a very important economic activity in Bengal. Apart from Bengal, there were not many areas in India which were important trading centers as well. So, economic or revenue was coming from taxing agriculture, but revenue was also coming from taxing trade. So, both trade as well as agriculture were important source of revenue to the extent that one third of the total revenue is coming from Bengal. Okay, so Bengal was important. But trade which is happening in Bengal was happening through two, two major routes. One route was the oceanic route through which trade was happening with European countries. But another route through which trade was happening with Central Asian and European countries was the land route as well. And this is a part of the silk route that had historically existed. Okay, now uh, I'm giving you this context because of a reason. Okay, that basically there were two major routes of trade. One was through the land and the other was through the oceanic route. Okay, now in the oceanic route, basically the trade was happening between the Indian trader and the European traders. It was the Europeans who were coming to the Indian ports, buying Indian goods and selling them then in Europe. Now, it is at this point of time, there were many others. There were the Portuguese also, there were the Dutch also. But the two major that we'll discuss repeatedly again and again, uh, European powers which were seeking to establish trade relations with India was French and the British. Okay, And also 17th century and also 18th century in Europe, just like India and Pakistan are today, 18, no, that's not a correct comparison, I mean, but still, you know, what I'm trying to say is the rivalry, the rivalry that existed between France and Britain in 18th century was a kind of rivalry that one could see between India and some other powers in the region, let's put it that way, because I don't think there's a rivalry anymore between India and Pakistan, but nonetheless, but one could see there was a very strong rivalry between uh, 
English and the French and both of them were competing to establish trade relations and great trading rights with as many regions as possible including with India okay so that was one of the contexts so there was a trade there was a competition to get trading rights here and we'll talk a bit more about this in a minute but the other route was the land route also but this is something that I've not told you till now if you see uh, in the first picture right of the first of this PPT that what is this what is this this is the what is that third picture adjacent to Aurangzeb's picture in between is Aurangzeb what is that other thing yeah that's the peacock throne in the sense uh, that the peacock throne had the Kohinoor at the top and then uh, then it went to the British somehow okay, and that's all we want from the British now the Kohinoor Sachi Tagore has made a career out of it okay, but nonetheless okay, uh, so uh, now what why I am telling you about this particular thing is that by 1720s it was becoming clear that there was no strong central Mughal emperor and the only thing which had prevented Afghan invasions for a long period of time into North and Central India was a central strong Mughal ruler. It was only during Aurangzeb's time that Afghan invasions came to an end because of a strong Mughal empire which existed in the Northwest. In, in fact, uh, uh, Aurangzeb appointed Shivaji, once he had subdued Shivaji in the Deccan region as the military general to, uh, to protect the Mughal Empire on its borders with Afghanistan in the sense that this was a very important border to protect which required an able military commander and because there was always a threat of frequent Afghan invasions that would happen from this region once there was no longer a central Mughal Emperor Afghan invasions repeatedly started happening and it was and what was the Afghan invasions about these were for example people like uh, Nadir Shah, people like Ahmad Shah Abdali, etc. And the Afghan invaders basically would come, invade, loot and take away and plunder and would take away the wealth with them back. So they would come, plunder, loot and go back. They would not stay and establish an administrative structure. So one could say they were trying to collect Hafta. So basically they would come, plunder, loot and go back. And it was in one of these plunderings which happened in 1738 that Nadir Shah took away the peacock throne and so also the Kohinoor. The peacock throne in all likelihood was dismantled and was broken down or something happened to it but the Kohinoor survived and so you have the Kohinoor in the crown of the British now. Now it is in this context but why am I telling you this is that in 1738 is when Nadir Shah invades Delhi he plunders Delhi, the main seat of the Mughal Empire. And so this is a clear reflection. You don't need to remember this, but this is a clear reflection of what? That even when the Mughal Empire is existing in 1738, it is no longer as strong as it was under Aurangzeb. So it is symptomatic of the decline of the Mughal Empire. And so also the uh, regional players or the regional governors start exerting autonomy, recognizing that there is not a very, there is not a very glorious future for central Mughal rule at this point of time. Also because of these frequent invasions that were happening because of the Afghan invaders, the problem that started creeping in was that because of the repeated invasions, the land route was no longer safe. It was no longer safe to do trade through the land route because if you would, it would like, it was like Gurgaon after 10. It's not safe for anyone. Not just for women, it's not safe for men as well. Right? So, in that sense, it became an unsafe route for doing trade. And so, the dependence on the land route diminished, while that on the oceanic route increased. And so, it's indirectly making for trade Indians also, or let's not say Indians at this point of time, but people from the subcontinent more dependent also on trade relations through the oceanic route okay that's the context now with this you know that is there now one thing also that okay uh, the first class will 
I'll leave you some. I'm not leaving you right now. First class, I'll leave you in like 10 minutes or so, so you can set your expectations there. And uh, probably we'll uh, take 5, 5, 10, 10, 15 minutes extra every class. That's fine, right? Now, uh, so the next, so the one thing is about this. The other context that you need to know is Bengal, firstly, had rich agriculture, had rich trade. But one thing that you need to know about trade, that if you want to do trade, what do you need? What do you need for doing trade? Money. Yes, money. You need loans. You need short term capital to buy goods. Then you sell the goods. Then you make some profit. So you need a working capital to buy goods and sell goods. So wherever there are merchants, there are also or merchants or traders, there are also bankers. You need somebody to give you short term loan so that you can buy goods and then sell it to somebody else and then pay back the loan and make profits right so even so what you need here is definitely for making the tra trading system work somebody who can give short term loans and so is the role of the bankers is something that also becomes important see as long as there was only revenue collection only the jagirdars were important when trading also became important then somebody who gave short term loans to the traders also became important and that is the bankers okay so bankers are becoming important and also who's becoming important apart from the bankers also the jagidars continue to be important but under we'll see that and uh, probably you can write this down that you can draw this with me uh, that this timeline of how was this happening okay one thing that you will see is that murshid kuli He starts exerting autonomy. He is the governor of Bengal and he remains the governor of Bengal from 1717 to 1729. Date is not important, but I am telling you. But that he is alive till 1729. He dies a natural death in 1729 and he continues to be the governor till the end of his life. Then after his death, there is also a succession dispute within Bengal and between his son, his grandson, etc some of whom come, who come to power for some period of time. But then, with the help of the Jagat Seth brothers, one of the commanders within, who is the Jagat Seth brothers we'll talk about. With the help of somebody by the name of Jagat Seth brothers, basically, they were important bankers within the court of Bengal. They were important bankers within the court of Bengal. And with the support of the Jagat Seth brothers, who were important bankers within the court of Bengal, came to power the military commander of governor of Bengal at this point of time and that was Alivardi Khan. Alivardi Khan brought a military coup. He overthrew the successors of Murshid Kuli and with the support of the Jagat Seth brothers, he became the next major governor of Bengal. And after becoming the governor of Bengal, Alivardi Khan is the one who remains at helm till 1756 up till his death okay up till his death a natural death that he dies in 1756 Alivardi Khan remains the governor okay and Alivardi Khan you know he does not have too much loyalty to the central Mughal rule in fact by 1730 onwards what he starts doing is he stops paying any part of the revenue that he is collecting from Bengal to the central Mughal emperor. The earlier governor, though he maintained autonomy, he paid a portion of the revenue that he collected to the Mughal ruler. But he is breaking any symbolic association also with the Mughal ruler, central Mughal ruler. In fact, he started minting the coins also in his own name. Because under the Mughal ruler, what would happen was the coins would be minted in the name of the Central Mughal Emperor. The Friday prayers were also offered in the name of the of Alivardi Khan. Earlier it would be done that the Friday prayers would be offered in the name of the Central Mughal ruler. So he's making he's breaking his association completely with the centralized Mughal rule. And you see that Alivardi Khan basically is the one who is in charge of the affairs. But who who played an important role in bringing Alivardi Khan to power? was 
the Jagat Seed Brothers. Now, who are these Jagat Seed Brothers? The Jagat Seed Brothers were predominantly bankers. They gave short-term loans to the traders to buy goods and basically were responsible for the smooth functioning of trade in Bengal. Okay. Now, I'll give you some more examples later, but just for now, you keep this in mind. The next thing also, why Jagat Seed Brothers were important, not just because they were providing, you know, a support to the trading activities in Bengal, but also because they were providing a support to the Jagirdari system also that existed here. Let me explain how. See, what Alivardi Khan said was that we need to do something. Murshid Kuli also said so, but Alivardi Khan also carried this forward. They said that both of them, Murshid Kuli and Alivardi Khan understood that the central Mughal rule is suffering with serious problems. One of them is the Jagirdari crisis. We need to do something that the same Jagirdari crisis does not affect, <coughs> affect the state of Bengal. And for this, they brought in some reforms. One of the reforms that they brought in was that they reduced the number of Jagirdars. They said that rather than having so many small Jagirdars who keep fighting and is, uh, also are also difficult to control, let's just have few small, few, few number of Jagirdars or only a limited number of Jagirdars and give them bigger Jagirds. Okay? So rather than having large number of small Jagirdars, let's have small number of Jagirdars who have bigger Jagirds. That's the thing that he basically did. Was Murshid Kuli and later Alivardi Khan basically replaced the number of smaller Jagirdars and cultivated the rise of a few Jagirdars who had big areas under their control. This is just for your understanding. I'm trying to explain it to you why they are becoming important even for the Jagirdari system. That basically Murshid Kuli and Alivardi Khan cultivated the rise of big Jagirdars. And, and almost to the extent that 13 Jagirdars, only 13 Jagirdars were responsible for collecting half the revenue of Bengal. Okay. So that that to that extent they consolidated, you know, Jagirdaris into bigger Jagirdaris and also removed a number of smaller Jagirdars. So it is in this context that he basically is trying to, you know, consolidate and re reform the revenue collection system. But on the one side he did so, on the other side he also brought in another reform. He said that now onwards the big Jagirdars have to collect the revenue and pay the revenue to the government on time within the first week of every quarter. Every quarter or every month he said later that you have to pay the revenue to the governor on time. It cannot be that the Jagirdar says that there is a natural calamity. There is some problem because of which we are not able to collect the taxes and pay it on time. The Jagirdar has to pay the revenue on time to the governor. If the Jagirdar fails to do so, the Jagirdar can take a short term loan from Jagat Seth Brothers. So the Jagat Seth Brothers thus became important even for the smooth administration of revenue collection from agriculture as well. Now why I am explaining you this is to point out that Jagat Seth Brothers were important players in the in the administrative structure of Bengal. And so they had an important say on the revenue policies as well as on the trade policies that the Bengali state adopted. Okay, how? We'll see later. But for now you understand they were important power brokers in the administrative structure. They played a crucial role in the rise of Alivardi Khan and also later when Alivardi Khan died they played a crucial role in deciding who would replace come to power after Alivardi Khan so that's all that you remember for now will uh, yeah sir is it just like for uh, big communist uh, funding political parties big? Like big companies funding political parties one could say if the history of India were to be written a hundred years after this, somebody could would point out how, for example, yes, that's a, that's a fact that major political parties fund as well as influence Indian parties. That is why today under the RTI, there is no such provision by which you can ask for details of which particular company has funded which particular political party to what extent. There is no such law which or right by which you can ask for such information from India. But we can definitely say this about the Jagat Seed Brothers because they are long dead. And nobody is going to defend them here.
right? So in that sense, that yes, the influence. See, one of the most important thing has always been historically, politics has never been separate from economics, and those who have been in charge of economics or in charge of economy have often tried to control the politics as well. It's also the other way. Those who are in charge of politics have also tried to control the economics, but it's also been the other way. So I was talking to uh, our uh, one of the uh, workers who works in Vision uh, just before taking a class. So he's like, this is just a parting shot because she asked. So, so he's like, uh, you look at Sir Lalu, all of these people. These people were politicians and they were mass used wealth. And they, you know, after becoming politicians. So I just said, yeah, that's fine. But that's something that has gone on with centuries. Politicians have amassed wealth and have become rich. The new trend is where you see the rich becoming politicians. So that's something new for India. That's that's happening indirectly in India. But in US, it's reached its cult. Where you see now Trump. So you don't see Ammani fighting an election in India today. Right? But in U.S. you have Trump fighting election. So yeah, interface of politics and economics have continued. And that can be seen here as well. Okay, So we'll stop here, not burden you more than this today, so that you don't run away by the second class and say that this guy is boring, on top of that he keeps teaching. So uh, we'll also, one reminder, one you know pointer, In after the first three classes, I'll pick up pace. To me, this is a bit slower. So, I will increase the pace, but okay, for the first three class, we'll go a bit slower so that you get used to my style also. And if you have more doubt, you more problems about you know the content, the speed, the style, or want any changes, feel free to tell it to me during the class, after the class. I'll not share my email ID or my phone number till I have completed everything. Because till then, if you want to ask me anything, you ask me in the class or after the class. Once you've done everything, I'll share an email ID later. Okay, so that's there. Any other doubts still have? Hope to do. We have a class tomorrow also for history only. Right. So hope to see you tomorrow. Some of you, I hope, will turn up. Just kidding. I hope most of you will turn up. Thank you.